Hi, everyone. Welcome to day two of Genelio's 4D Cellular Physiology Workshop on the evolution of multicellularity. As a reminder, we have a few minutes for audience questions after each talk. So please write your question in the Q&A box at any time during the talks and the moderator will ask them. You are also welcome and encouraged to use the chat box to share your thoughts, comments, and ideas. But if you have specific questions for the speakers, please do put them in the Q&A box so that we can keep track of them. Um, please also don't forget that recordings of our talks and discussions during the workshop will be posted on Janelia's YouTube channel within the next few days. And with that, I will turn it over to Menu Prakash. Welcome everybody. Um, excited to have you all again for the second day. Um, much of what was uh, discussed yesterday will continue in the context of themes that are coming up. Uh, it was incredible to get a chance to see such a broad range of systems that we're all asking questions. I'm always returning back to Inyaki's framework of the invisible questions. I think in the end, this conference will be framed in that context of uh, uh, what we just don't know, what we don't know. Uh, I think it was very valuable yesterday uh, to end with frameworks uh, and a lot of uh, theoretical frameworks that might be new to the community at large and where the gaps are. Uh, today we'll continue a lot more on broadening both the systems and really a urgent need to be thinking about novel tools as well. So with that, I'm going to pass uh, to my co-organizers, uh, Wallace, uh, for the first session. Uh, Wallace Marshall from UCSF. All right, thanks Manu. Thanks everybody for, for joining us today. So this morning session, um, in keeping with the theme of this uh, whole workshop is gonna focus on how cells interact both with each other and with their environment in terms of you know, mechanics, metabolism, um, uh, biochemistry and so on. So I think we'll see a wide variety of, of interesting topics that hopefully will gel around this sort of interaction idea as leading to evolution of multicellularity. So our first speaker will be OJ Campus from uh, the physics of life in Dresden. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Good, good. Okay. So, um, well, let me start actually by thanking the organizers actually for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and um, and to be involved in these discussions. So, yesterday actually we saw actually many different aspects of multicellular life. And today I, I want to actually touch upon a different aspect that it was mentioned yesterday, but it was not really touched upon, which was the role of mechanics in the organization of multicellular organisms. And in my talk, I'm going to really be focusing on animal species. So in my group, we're interested in, in how cells self-organize to, to build functional structures during embryonic development. And by that, I mean tissues, organs, uh, and structures like this. Now, this is a very complex question. It has many different aspects to it. So when that happens, it's, and in particular for this talk, I wanted to zoom out a little bit and see actually what are the essential components that you need in order to, to build multicellular organisms. And in my opinion, actually the work of um, Nicole King and coworkers is, is really a, a very nice example because they study kind of flagellates actually, which are the, the uh, unicellular common ancestor of animals. And they show actually that, well, I mean, these organisms actually can also form colonial structures or very um, simple multicellular structures. And by looking at the genes actually that, that these organisms have, they found actually kind of two categories of genes, two essential um, uh, functions, if you want, actually, that are uh, related to biochemical cell-cell communication and to the physical interactions between cells. So essentially, they found actually uh, signaling pathways or like the uh, portions of signaling pathways in the organisms that enable the cell-cell communication, and this is very important. If you wanna build, you wanna organize with other cells, you need actually to be able to communicate with them. But also they found adhesion molecules, actually like cadherins, that uh, are in, enable essentially the mechanical interaction between cells. And if you really wanna actually build structures, you need this mechanical, you need to control these mechanical interactions. Now, these two elements, the biochemical, biochemical cell-cell communication and the physical interaction or, or the mechanics are essential pivotal elements to understand how these structures are formed in, uh, um, in embryos of animal species, like the ones that I'm showing you here. Now, I'm gonna focus on these two aspects, but mainly on the physics or on the mechanics in particular. But I, let me start by saying something about the biochemical cell-cell communication. So over, over the last, I would say 50 to 70 years, there's been a lot of work on the genetic and molecular aspects of embryonic development. 
And in particular on cell-cell communication, we know what are the key molecular players. We know the signaling pathways. We know the signal transduction pathways. We know how cells respond to um, the signaling molecules. And we know it in the context of the embryo. So this is very important, actually. So we have a ton of information, not only in vitro, but also in vivo of how the things work. And this doesn't mean actually that obviously we understand everything. We need actually to do a lot more, but we have um, a good body of knowledge at this point. And this is because in this field, we have a ton of techniques, experimental techniques available to interrogate the embryo from, an, uh, from a molecular perspective. Now, on the other hand, we have actually the physical or the mechanical interactions. And we know that these are important for building organisms actually since before the RC Thompson actually, like we, we, we know that this is important. But it's only been in the last, I would say, 20 years or so, there's been a kind of a revival of these approaches that has come in parallel uh, with the advances in microscopy, some of which were led in Janelia by Philip Keller and, and Eric Bedzik. But essentially, it's these advances in microscopy that enable quantification of cell shapes, of cell movements, et cetera, et cetera, in the embryo. But I would argue that the mechanics goes beyond this, actually. When you measure mechanics, really what you want to measure is is the forces, the active stresses in the system. You want to measure actually material properties, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been very challenging in the field to measure mechanics within developing embryos. And not only within developing embryos, within three-dimensional multicellular systems. And let it be, that could be organoids, could be spheroids, could be any of these tools. But in particular in embryos, because they're changing shape as a function of time, actually, it's very difficult to keep calibrations in the system. But in any case, I would argue that if we don't have these two sides of the problem, if we don't understand these two sides of the problem, it's going to be very, very difficult to really have a complete view of how these processes are happening, or how these structures are being built during embryonic development. So how do we measure and perturb mechanics in situ and in vivo? Now, my group has been working on that for about 10 years now. So we've developed some techniques to do that. And one of the techniques that we use actually to measure um, forces, the endogenous forces actually that cells uh, generate inside embryos is this micro droplet technique that we essentially we put an oil droplet between the cells in the tissue, and then the cells apply forces to this droplet, they deform the droplet, and we can track the deformations in 3D uh, or even 4D, so we can actually track these deformations, and because we have the, calibra the calibration of these droplets, we can actually measure these stresses as a function of uh, space and time inside the embryo. So this allows us to measure the endogenous forces in the embryo, but actually we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted actually to also apply control forces in three-dimensional tissues. And the way we did it is by turning these droplets magnetic. So essentially this is actually a magnetic droplet. And when we apply a magnetic field, a, a uniform magnetic field, you can deform this droplet uh, and apply control forces actually. Essentially we generate a force dipole in the system. So let me show you how it looks in vivo when you put these droplets in between cells. And here is an example actually that we use, like these are droplets that are about cell size and we use them actually to poke on individual cells and study the response of the cells to the, to, to the mechanical forces. Essentially you can do in vivo mechanobiology. On the other hand, if you make the droplets bigger, now you can start probing the material properties that emerge at the supercellular scales. You can actually probe actually the tissue mechanics at supercellular scales. So what do we do with these techniques? Obviously now with this at hand, we could answer a lot of questions in the field or we can at least tackle the questions. But here I'm not gonna go and explain many, many of the questions. I've, I've grouped them into two big questions. One would be, how does mechanics guide tissue organization and morphogenesis? So this is more about how you scope these multicellular structures. And the second question is, how does mechanics affect cell behavior? So this has to do with how cells sense and respond to mechanical, to mechanical cues in vivo. Let me focus first on the, on the first question. So imagine you have uh, a piece of tissue like this, there's a, structu a structureless or shapeless, and you want it actually, or obviously the, the cells want it or the, or the embryo wants actually to get into a shape that looks like this, for instance, a functional structure in the embryo. So how do you do that? So from a physical perspective, it's rather easy actually. The only thing that you need to do, and obviously this biological is complicated, <laughs> but the only thing that you need to do is to control in a space and time the mechanics of the tissue or the growth. So you need to create gradients in either the active stresses in the tissue, the material properties, or the growth pattern in the tissue. So, but this is actually very abstract. So let me show you actually how it looks in vivo. So when, once we had these techniques that I just told you, what we decided to do is go to the, an embryo and really actually measure this in a, in a situation that is important for morphogenesis, for the, uh, 
for, for generating these structures. And we chose to study the elongation of the vertebrate body axis, the, the head to tail axis, what is called the anterior posterior axis. So what we did is it's very simple. We just took the tools actually, and we actually really quantified the mechanics actually along the anterior posterior axis. And actually, to our surprise, we discover the existence of fluid to solid tissue transitions. So the tissue can, can exist in fluid and solid state and can transit between these states. Actually, so these are phase transitions, really. And what we found is that at the posterior end of the body, the, the cells are actively maintaining the tissue in a fluid state. And they do that by, by having very dynamic cell-cell contacts that they drive neighbor exchanges and essentially meld the tissue in a fluid state. And then what happens is that the cells mature um, and, and go from A to B to C. What's happening actually is that the cells close down, close down spaces and jam packed into solid-like structures, essentially to keep the tissue shape. You give mechanical integrity to the tissue. So, so with these techniques, actually, we could actually discover new mechanisms of morphogenesis. And I'm hoping actually that we were gonna be able actually to discover other actually physical aspects of, of multicellular systems actually now that we can quantify uh, physical fields in vivo. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the other question that I think is perhaps the most important. So if you look at any multicellular structure, you have cells there that are sensing biochemical cues and they're also sensing mechanical cues actually from the microenvironment. Now I've already told you about the biochemical cues. We can actually measure this in vivo we, we have a lot of techniques to do that. Actually, it would be very helpful to have, for instance, um, a spatial temporal control that would be optogenetics. And Janelia has been leading that in the, in, or have been using actually these tools in the neuroscience program actually. So it would be very interesting to co-opt actually some of those techniques actually for here for development. But what about mechanical cues? So we know that mechanics affect cell behavior. And we know that because we have a ton of information from in vitro studies, a lot of it. Like, we, like people have taken cells, put them in culture. We have a lot of techniques to measure forces and material properties. So, so people actually have discovered that in culture, both the mechanical forces and the material properties of the, of the microenvironment affect cell behavior. And by that, I mean cell migration, cell proliferation, cell division, and actually, importantly, cell differentiation. So this was a, a landmark study by the group of Dennis Discher, where they showed that by changing the stiffness of the substrate, you can actually direct the stem cell differenti differentiation in the absence of any instructive biochemical cue. So just mechanics of the microenvironment. So essentially what all these actually told us, this body of work told us is that the mechanical, cue, mechanical cues affect cell behavior to kind of the same extent than biochemical cues. But the issue is all this is in vitro. So what about in vivo? So it turns out that in vivo, we know very little. We know kind of what are the molecules that enable sensing of mechanics. For instance, we know YAPTAS, we know Bidecatinin, and actually we know Piezo. Now everyone knows Piezo, I hope. <laughs> so, um, but we know these molecules, but we don't know really how cells perceive mechanical cues or mechanics actually in an in vivo setting and how that affects cells behavior and the endogenous mechanics in the tissue. And actually, this, what, this slide is a little bit misleading because if I wanted to compare mechanical cues to biochemical cues, I should have actually made this panel like this size. So we know essentially almost nothing about the mechanical aspects. And I wanna emphasize this because essentially we only know half of the story. We know how cells kind of smell, like it would be biochemical sensing, but we don't know the sense of touch of cells and actually how they perceive these cues. So I really think actually that this question is something that it's gonna be important in the future actually to try to understand. And I wanna finish by thanking everyone who did this work in my group. So my group uh, uh, at the University of California actually, which is where I did, we did this work. And also I'm just gonna leave this here actually, which is uh, how I think actually that uh, Janelia can leverage its strengths actually to help in this field, especially with deep tissue imaging of the genetic tools and image analysis. And we can actually discuss that later, thank you. Well, maybe I can ask, um, what do you, it seems you've highlighted the, the challenges of measuring and applying forces at the tissue scale. What about the subcellular scale? I mean, do things like these magnetic fluid droplets, would that still work if you made one small enough to put inside of a cell? Yeah, we, we're doing that actually. It's just that we were not, uh, in my group, we were interested in more like cellular and supercellular in the embryo, but um, here in, um, in Max Planck and at the Physics of Life, actually, we are teaming up with people who are interested in subcellular and we are adapting the technique to subcellular. I mean, it, it is nothing that, we can definitely do it. The only problem is if you go very small, you're limited by the um, 
by the capillary stress of the droplets. It becomes actually very difficult to deform droplets. But but we can go down to a micron. Okay, great. Uh, Zev, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Wallace, and, and thanks, Sache. Uh, my question really yeah, it gets to sort of the democratization of some of these tools. Uh, you know, the the ability to make these these measurements uh, in context is so powerful. Um, what do you think is necessary to make this technique sort of routine in the field so that uh, a non a lab without a physics background can kind of get their hands dirty relatively quickly? So we, okay, so we've tried, um, okay. So I we try to commercialize them actually, so to make it much simpler for everyone to to get them actually directly, even if you didn't have expertise on on, on this. Um, but and for instance, the magnetic droplets are still a little bit too finicky to commercialize, and for the normal droplets, I feel it's actually quite easy actually to do. So so then actually we're in this kind of limbo in between uh, in between like shall we commercialize it, but it's actually not at this stage or or we should not actually wait a little bit. I mean, I'm, I, I help everyone who asks. Uh, that's the only thing that I can say at this moment, but, but it's true that maybe actually having a platform that actually could... Um, so by the way, we're doing this here at Max Planck and Physics of Life. We're actually creating a, a facility for this actually, but obviously this is not gonna be open to everyone in the world. I mean, it's more for the local environment, but, um, but it, it would be interesting to think about options actually how to make them available to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm all for that actually. Okay, we have 45 seconds left. Will Radcliffe, can you ask your question and OJ answer it in that time? Yes. Walker, great talk. I love the liquid Thanks. to solid phase transition as a way of generating interesting structures. Uh, do you have any insights into how this might uh, work in other taxa so that are not animals? Well, that's a very good point. So I didn't talk about this, but actually my group has worked on, um, on wall cells, on yeast and uh, on plants. And actually, the funny thing is that the physical mechanism of shaping the uh, elongated the structures works very similar. It's just that in those organisms, what happens is that the cell wall is fluidized. You have enzymes that fluidize the wall and, and you transit. In, in, instead of having a fluid solid transition mediated by jamming, in that case, you have it mediated by gelation. You gelate the, 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 the wall or not. So you can digest the wall locally and let it expand under turgor pressure. And then, so actually the physical mechanism is actually similar. It's actually interesting that at very different scales and across uh, organisms, it's similar, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the Thanks. uni versus multicellular implementation of a similar idea. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks. So we, we, we're, we're, we're out of time now. So um, uh, those who have, there's a number of questions in, in, in the chat and Jennifer, I see you have your hand up, but we're, we're actually out of time. I wonder if you could also add, maybe add your question to the chat and Oche, maybe you could take a look and, and try to answer them. Um, so, uh, Let's all offer some virtual applause for, for, for the wonderful first talk for, the, for this morning. And so then um, our, our next speaker will, in fact, be Will Ratcliffe from University of, for, from Georgia Tech, sorry. All right, let me just share my screen. Okay, is it looking good? Yeah. Looks good. All right, thanks. Great, well, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been a blast. Um, Everybody here knows that multicellularity has evolved repeatedly in different lineages and that this is a highly context dependent process. By the way, every picture here is an independently evolved multicellular lineage. Inaki gave a great talk yesterday when she highlighted the progress in the field of how really we've shifted from thinking that sort of multicellular, you know, innovations were at the genetic level, really to being realizing that most of the genes that multicellular organisms use, this is true for plants, but also true for uh, sorry, true for animals, true for plants, true for fungi. I don't think we really know other lineages as well. <laughs> um, but it's really the, the sort of evolutionary innovation is not in the genes themselves, but how they're used. Primarily, these things existed in the unicellular ancestor and were put to novel multicellular function. While we know a lot about the genetics and behavior of extant multicellular organisms, we know far less about the evolutionary dynamics of how they became multicellular in the, in the first place and how they sort of co opted those unicellular behaviors and traits and, and built a complex organism around that. So as Manu said, we, you know, frameworks are important. And for me, evolutionary biology is the, is a very important, it's the most important of several frameworks that I think in, but the evolutionary framework for thinking about multicellularity kind of goes like this. The first step is that you need to have a life cycle. You need to, you need to figure out how cells can form groups and how those groups can reproduce themselves. If they can't reproduce, they can't be part of a Darwinian process. Second, these groups of cells have to become Darwinian individuals. That is, they have to have 
uh, variation in multicellular traits, that variation needs to be at least somewhat heritable. Selection needs to act on that variation and then need to be able to adapt at the multicellular level. And all the things that we think of as being sort of integral to multicellularity, I see, and I think this is generally the sentiment in the field, there's some variation around in, in different groups, but these are, these are outcomes of you know, multicellular adaptation, multicellular development, cellular specialization, the evolution of novel morphologies, right? The beginning of multicellularity was always a dumb clump of cells. So all the complex stuff comes after that, through this process of multicellular adaptation. We also see cells getting entrenched in a multicellular context, that they can't really revert to unicellularity very easily. We don't know of any you know, unicellular lineages descended from animals or plants, for, uh, you know, for instance. So as, as far as you know, having a framework, we know that it kind of had to go down like this, but we don't really understand how these dynamics actually occurred in these extant lineages of multicellularity because this happened hundreds of millions of years ago, in some cases over a billion years ago, and, and this information is kind of lost to the sands of time. But you can use a bottom-up to sort of you know, paraphrase Karina's phrasing. You can use a bottom-up uh, approach to look at multicellular construction that involves experimental evolution, directed evolution, synthetic biology and mathematical modeling to, to understand how you go from a dumb clump of cells into something which is becoming more and more integrated at the multicellular level. So our model system is just one, but, but it's a pretty cool one, is, uh, is the yeast. We call these snowflake yeast. We've evolved them from a single celled ancestor, uh, just with daily passaging with a round of selection for multicellular size for larger multicellular groups. And they form this cool fractal uh, structure. If you look in the upper right hand corner, you can see how snowflake grows. They are not aggregative, they don't stay together. Daughter cells just remain attached to mother cells after division. And so you get this, again, sort of branchy structure arising. Um, once they kind of run out of room, you actually have me mechanics playing an important role in the origin of a life cycle. You run out of room, the cells in these clusters jam, you get cells pressing on a jammed structure, you get fracture. And if you break any single cell cell connection, it's like cutting a branch off a tree, you get a little baby branch floating away and that's your propagule. So you get a life cycle totally for free, just again, through mechanics, as Otger sort of showed, mechanics are fundamental to multicellularity. And what's more, because of the way in which these cells are structured, they, again, they're, they're in sort of this branch structure. If you, any, if you imagine that you've disconnected any cell-cell connection, right? The cell that's at the base of the group that separates is the mother of every other cell downstream in that branch. So you have these genetic bottlenecks embedded in this life cycle. They're a little bit slower than pure single cell genetic bottlenecks, but they also mathematically guarantee that genetic variation as it arises through mutation will be segregated out into different lineages, which basically prevents cheating from really being an issue from the get-go. Again, this is not evolving for a purpose. It's just all for free. It's just outcome of the way these things work. So, okay, we have groups, they have a life cycle. How do they have heredity for novel multicellular traits? I think in, in Naki's framing, this was a question that we didn't, this is sort of a third type of question. We don't really know how this arises. In modern organisms, it's developmentally controlled. Once you have genetically regulated development, it's pretty easy. You tweak developmental genes, you have a genetic basis for multicellular traits, bingo, bango, you're going. But we don't have that in dumb clumps of cells. So how do we get this thing going? Uh, so it turns out that, again, you kind of get this for free. Uh, imagine that we have just a population of yeast, and there are mutations that affect the shape of these cells. There's mutations that make them more elongate. We can, we can measure the heritability of this population. It's pretty heritable. If I were to select on cell shape, I, they, they would respond to that selection. If I put these in a multicellular context now, now we have a new emergent multicellular trait to consider. It's the size of the group at fracture. Turns out for good physics reasons, the longer the cells are in the group, the bigger the cells grow, the groups grow before they break apart. And so if we empirically measure the heritability of, of this same mutation in a multicellular population, it's actually far more heritable. And there's a good reason for this. It turns out that once you have these mutations in groups, the group level trait gets to average over some of that cell level noise. And in fact, there are really nice connections here to uh, soft matter packing and, and issues of maximum entropy that explain this phenomena very beautifully. But here's the cool, here's the sort of takeaway message for biologists. We've long considered that this to be a stumbling block for, for sort of group selection issues. You know, it's typically thought that if you're selecting on groups, you have a noisier phenotype that's disconnected from the unit of heredity, which would be mutations in cells. But here, if you have mutations in clonal groups, 
it turns out that they can drive the emergence of a new multicellular trait. And that multicellular trait isn't just somewhat heritable, it can be more heritable than the cell level trait itself, which is, I think that's pretty cool. And it means that if we were to select on size over the long run, we should be able to get something cool happening. So that's what we did. We've instituted a long-term evolution experiment to select on snowflake yeast. We're about 5,000 generations into a planned 50,000 generation experiment. I know it's ambitious, but basically you want to do this until I retire or die, whichever one comes first. And uh, our yeast have evolved to be about 20,000 times larger so far. And our groups are very densely packed. And one thing I'll point out that's, that's it's kind of neat, kind of trivial. I don't know if it means anything yet, but right here, you can see a cell-cell connection. This is typical of buds in, in our yeast. All, all I'm measuring here is, is cytoplasm. So if you see this little connection between the cells, that means they're actually connected. Typically, there would be a cell wall dividing those cells and there'd be no, no connection, information, resource flow between cells. In these highly evolved ones, about a third of our cells remain permanently connected, even after those daughter cells themselves are dividing, which normally would, wouldn't happen in yeast. I don't know if this is important yet, but we're beginning to see mechanisms through which our yeast can become more integrated. This sort of paves the way for the ability for them to do more organismal stuff. Now, 20,000 times larger is a big change. This requires that they become a lot stronger. Now, you might imagine that they're evolving to become sticky or make things which you know adhere cells to one another or in increase the strength of cell-cell bonds. But the main innovation is actually one, a, a, a mechanical one. The main innovation is that they evolved to change the geometry of their cell budding and, and, and cell shape such that the cells begin to um, wrap around each other. So rather than being trees where if you cut off a branch and the branch falls away, they're now these vine-like integrated structures. So to, to, to break them apart requires that you rip thousands of cellular connections. All right, this is my last slide. I know I'm running out of time here, but I think this bottom-up approach for under, you know, essentially constructing a new multicellular organism offers opportunities to explore questions that we care about that, that would be almost impossible to address by just looking at contemporary organisms. You might be able to, but this is another way of doing it. So one is understanding how simple clusters of cells evolve to, be, to make big and strong bodies. This is a sort of universal thing for all multicellular things that evolve to get big. They also have to get strong. It's a biophysical question. And right now it's one that actually is relatively under, uh, understudied. We all care about the origin of development, both genetic and bioelectric. And I think that the two primary ways in which this is gonna happen, um, there may be more, but these are probably the two most important ones that I, can, that I can think of, are number one, as soon as you have a group of cells, you have ready gradients in resources and information, which number one, act as information molecules that allow you to know where you are. And so you can evolve you know, space and time dependent behaviors as cells. Number two, you can also get pre-existing genotype by environment interactions. Cells behave differently if they're on the outside versus the inside. And if that's adaptive, it can easily be co-opted. Number two, if you have something which grows like a snowflake yeast outwards, which is actually one of the most common ways of growing as a multicellular organism, cell age provides a pretty reliable cue for, for location. And in our system, we actually see novel age-dependent behaviors in chaperone protein behavior, which dictate the emergence of multicellular traits. So we're actually seeing the beginnings of developmental processes arising through age-dependent variation. We care about new morphologies. I mean, Look, snowflake yeast are cool. Spheres of yeast blobs are cool, but that's not the kind of complexity that we really engage with when it comes to multicellularity. Building bodies requires breaking the symmetries and sim and, uh, that simple you know, physical growth patterns give you. So we've been trying to figure out how to get tori in our snowflake yeast, because you know, once you have a torus, which is a donut, that's a different topological class than a sphere. And it's pretty hard for something which just grows as a branch structure to make a torus. And, but we can do it. We can actually start with a single cell and have it reliably develop with high, high heredity into a donut. And so this is something which is exciting as, as a, as a overinflated donut myself. Uh, I mean, humans are all tori. This is cool because it's a new topological class that we can begin to explore. We're interested in understanding how, I'll, I'll just finish up really quick, on how cells get stuck in a multicellular context on how early life cycles constrain downstream evolutionary dynamics and how environmental drivers affect the evolution of multicellularity. And I think there's a lot of ways to approach each of these questions. Synthetic biology with experimental evolution is a pretty cool path. You can do things like in our yeast, we've made them use light for energy. They're phototrophic now. And so we can see how that affects the subsequent evolution of multicellularity, and it does affect it. We know that, it, that oxygen limitation is one of the strongest limiting you know, constraints on multicellular body size. 
Um, and different organisms figure out different ways around that constraint. Animals, as soon as they evolve to be more than two cell layers thick, start making oxygen binding proteins that increase O2 diffusion through their tissues. So we took a sperm whale, myoglobin, and engineered that into our snowflake yeast, which makes it kind of pink, you know, like, like muscle. And we're evolving it with that, with that trait and seeing how that changes, again, the sort of downstream consequences of, of adaptation. In any case, I also think that there's many cool things that you can do with any one system and yeast are great because you can do lots of synthetic biology. There are questions that you can only address by, by exploring. I mean, actually the evolution of multicellularity, broadly speaking, is a question you can only address by having multiple different systems with different pre-existing ancestral cell biology, with different types of, of life cycles available and developmental modes available. And so I'm, I'm excited for other sort of beginnings of this kind of, kind of approach. Nicole King and Kai Tong are doing an experiment with quantiflagellates. And Omaya Dudin is doing an experiment with ichthyosporians. He, he did his postdoc in Anaki's group and is now has his own group. These are both animal relatives. I think it'll be really exciting. And I know them over time. So thank you all for, uh, for being here. And thanks to everyone that actually did the work. I'll take questions. OK, so yeah, there's way more questions coming up than you could possibly address now. Um, so I'm going to just try to pick a couple of them. So one, one qu clarification question was, um, it was asked whether, um, this is from Amaya Dudin, which is, um, is it the, the case that the cells remain connected by a cytoplasmic bridge through, through the bud next and it's actually a syncytium? So yeah, we, we don't really know. We've actually tried ex expressing single uh, molecule GFP to watch it flow between the cells and the experiments weren't very conclusive. Um, we don't know if there's, a, if there's a plasma membrane there or not. Uh, but that's something which, you know, too many projects haven't really dedicated the time to figure that out. But I, th I think it might be going there. That's a, and that's, I last checked that at time point 600. We're at time point 1,100 days of selection. So things might have actually changed a lot since we've been able to double the length of the experiment nearly. And it'll be, you know, if, if this goes from maybe 30% to 80% or something, then I think we're in business, right? That'd be, that'd be much more interesting to me. Yeah, cool. Uh, Vad Perez asked whether the direction of growth inside these things is, is um, relate, regulated in some way, such for example, if you have small cells trapped inside a, a big, big flake, are they unable to grow bigger just from mechanical constraints? Good question. I don't think in the mechanical constraints prevent cell elongation. Uh, yeast cells can get up to about eight megapascals of turgor pressure, and these clusters break at seven <laughs> if, we, if we crush them. So I think they're able to push their way around. And in fact, we don't really see a huge variance in size. It seems like they're all about, I mean, there's variance, but it doesn't seem like there's classes where the internal ones are small. Oh, and there's been several questions about, do you know what, why you're able to make a donut? Yeah, we're, we're working on that. I have a pretty good idea, but until we really know, I don't want to say, especially in public, because we could be wrong. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being wrong. That's what we're all about here. Um, so I, I, yeah, anyway, I, I'd be happy to elaborate on that in the future. Okay, so uh, another question is, um, it, uh, this is from Alex Bisson. If you, if you, can you try to make a reversion back to unicellularity? Oh, yeah. And Great that is question. the reverse of the same genetic pathway. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I kind of, you know, 10 minute talk, you can't say that much. Yes, we've been working on this for years. And it gets harder and harder to revert them the longer they've been evolving. Um, you can't just revert the, the first mutation. Yeah, it gets, you, it gets you back, you know, up to about 400, 600 transfers, depending on what lineage you're looking in, because everything is in replicate lineages. But by 1,000 transfers, nothing is reverting with that one mutation, although it makes them a lot smaller. But you have to go in and tinker with other things to make them actually revert. Um, and in the context of multicellularity, this idea of entrenchment, we actually do see them get progressively entrenched. Not that the single cells die when they're liberated from the groups but that their fitness is much lower. Basically the mutations which make them good at growing as a snowflake that underlie these increased you know, ma massive mechanical changes, those harm cell growth rates dramatically. So you get these cells that are just, they're not good at, you know, ecologically, they don't compete well. And so finally, kind of, I think it's the first yeah. steps of entrenchment. Yeah. And just one last question from Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz asks whether you see cells becoming multinucleated or I guess more generally, are there defects that arise in you know, chromosome segregation that might create a bottleneck that you can't escape from once you get into these weird um, clusters? That is a good question. Um, I don't have, I don't think they're multinucleate. There may but be- aneuploid. There may be aneuploid. You know, we're doing, we're doing the kind of sequencing. We've just done Illumina primarily so far, which isn't great for looking at that, but we're doing, uh, you know, long read sequencing and stuff now, which I think will help with that. Um, so I think, there I are think there's some bottlenecks. Because I yeah. think there's parallels there to when people bred, you know, um, yeast for making beer, right? And as yeah. you get flocculating and barmy yeast, you got aneuploidy. Right. Anyway, I think we, yeah. we have to move on. Um, sure, sure, there's sure. a million questions. Please take the time to, and I think you're, you know, it's great to see that how many questions got simulated by that talk. Awesome. Thanks.
Okay, so our, our next talk will be from, uh, oh, so let, let, let's give a round of virtual applause for Will's talk. It's always very unsatisfying by, by Zoom, but we'll do what we can. So the next speaker is Karen Alim from both the MPI uh, for um, Self-Organization and also Technical University of Munich. Yes, perfect. Uh, okay, now you can hear me, perfect. Um, thanks uh, you know, for having me. Um, I'm like you, all of you, uh, fascinated by life and in particularly how shape arises and adapts. And um, my um, beloved um, building block is actually flow networks. And um, so in... Um, it, they're the key building block in um, an organism to transport resources around that may be the vessels pervading you, but also in a very pure form um, as the entire body of fungi and slime molds. And so what now ensures that resources actually get delivered well is that you have the proper network architecture that makes sure um, everything gets everywhere where it needs to be. Um, and now what is cool about living systems is that these individual tubes that make up a network, they are actually adaptive. So they change their diameter um, over time to ensure that the morphology is actually the right one. Um, and so if I, if I actually go in and measure such a morphology, like a fixer network, and I quantify um, the individual diameters, then I find that uh, they obey um, Murray's law, this geometric relationship between the radii of the tubes. Now, the fascinating insight is that this um, seems to hold universally, um, not only for animals like us, but um, also for um, plants, for fungi and slimes. And so obviously the building blocks, um, uh, biological building blocks are entirely different. Um, so what makes them these very different organisms to obey the same laws must be that what's governing their dynamics is, is physics. And so the physics they share here is the physics of the flows through this tubular networks. And so already Murray about a century ago coined the idea that is now widely accepted that fluid flows actually drive the dynamics of tube diameters. But now uh, flows can act in a variety of ways, right? So if I zoom in on a tube, then um, the fluid flow comes with pressure, it exerts a shear force on the tube wall, or it can transport resources and thereby govern resource availability. And, and now to distinguish which one is acting is actually really hard experimentally. I mean, how, how do you measure pressures in, you know, of a fluid in, in a cell, um, in a tube? Um, and so this is really where the physics challenge of flow networks actually surfaces, because um, if I zoom on a tube and I have this tube actually, um, you know, it has an increased shear force and it dilates, then not only the flow in that one tube changes, but um, this whole network is actually coupled. And so if one tube takes up more fluid volume, then it also changes the flow in all other parts of the network. And so now, but now the shear force in another tube change, right? And so if that shear force changed, then also that tube might adapt. And so you see that there's a feedback between flow and morphology. Um, and so I was to disentangle this, this feedback between flows and morphology. And, um, and I would like to show you uh, that my roadmap, which I believe is actually needs to combine experiments, detailed quantification and theoretical models combined to to overcome the physics challenge that we face here as well, and, you know, despite the biological question. Um, and so to untangle the feedback between uh, flow and morphology, um, first of all, I mean, we have to find, you know, this local flow feedback, you know, what's the flow property that's governing tube change. Um, but then, you know, what is actually, you know, the role of network topology? I mean, there are different topologies in network. What is the optimal topology for certain network functions? And different tubular networks that we have might have different functions. Um, what is the role of network hierarchy? You know, network hierarchy is the pattern of having thick and thin tubes. Can we program the hierarchy for functionality? Um, and once you we learned all of that, can we use this repertoire to actually control a network function, use the tools, the signals that are transported to so self-organize network pathology? So among this, this roadmap, I today decided I, I'm going to tell you one short story, uh, and I'm going to take the one that probably, you know, sounds weirdest to you, you know, what is network hierarchy and why would we care about it? Um, and so 
What you might have seen already from these microscope pictures is that I'm not using blood vessels to investigate these questions. In fact, I'm actually using a very different organism. I'm using a slime mold, um, Phasarum polycephalum, that you see here crawling in an arena um, with dots of food. And so this organism um, is a unicellular organism. So um, it grows as a single gigantic cell with thousands of nuclei in um, a single uh, cell envelope that also happens to have a network shape. And here you see how this network shape is very dynamic, reorganizing um, over time, thickening tubes, thinning tubes. Um, actually, this entire movie happens on the scale of three days. So in fact, if you um, zoom into a network um, on this time scale of a couple of hours, it's actually rather static. Um, but uh, the cool thing is that we can actually you know, look at the network tubes and um, the flows at the same time. So we can even do more, like we can quite, um, image the entire network morphology and therefore even back calculate the flows and the pressures with theoretical models. So we know it all and that's the cool thing. So what we actually see here is that um, these tubes are, um, have an actomyosin cortex that's rhythmically contracting and driving the fl flows through these tubes. Um, and so now we can, we can use this to understand, you know, how flows and networks feed back on each other. And so I want to look at this um, with the question of what's the role of network hierarchy. And so I'm going to play this movie one more time, um, but you get a task and your task is you follow this food source. Um, there are three of them, but you follow the one in the middle. I'm going to take my point away. So you see, well, when Fazarum finds these food sources, it really exhausts them entirely and then keeps on moving, trying to find other ones. Okay, now here's your task. So where was the food source? I believe all of you entirely spotted the food source. It was there. How did you do that? You saw this ring of a thick vein um, that's circling the former food source. This observation sparked the idea that actually the pattern of where have thick and where have thin tubes is memory. So that starts the question, you know, does, you know how would you encode um, the nutrient location in, um, as memory? And is this really memory? And so to solve this question, my PhD student, Monokrama, did a more controlled experiment where we put down a food source in, um, presented to a network that's really static and we can quantify it. And we see that within the first 15 minutes, tubes close to the food stomach dilate. And further back, we have a new pattern of very thick, thin tubes um, established that persists. Now, what are actually the dynamics of these tubes that makes this happen? So if you order the individual tube segments by distance to the food source up uh, here, over and look at their dynamics over time, normalized by the diameter before the stimulus hits at the white line, you see that the uh, front of dilation propagates in, rest of the tubes are contracting because of conservation of fluid volume. The key is, the speed of dilation is 15 microns per second, which is um, the speed by which particles would be transported. And so this sets the um, hypothesis that what actually goes on is that um, nutrient trigger um, softening of the tubes um, and this uh, softening stimulus is transported by the flows. Now the key is we can put this hypothesis in a model um, we make one more step of simplification of looking at the network as a 1D system. So we can solve the entire dynamics of a softening molecule being transported along the tube. Um, you know, given um, that we know the parameters of the system well, and this model now allows us to really predict the dynamics close by to the stimulus tubes dilate in blue. Further away, they first shrink and later on dilate. Now, having this quantitative, qualitative description, we can uh, identify exactly the same pattern in the experimental data, verify further predictions from the model, and take home the um, finding that indeed what sets up a hierarchy here is that I have a softening molecule, transport with the fluid flows, um, and thicken in the tube where it gets to. Now, this sets up a pattern. Is this memory? Yes, it is, because the the softening molecule will be influenced by previous memory, by a previous pattern of thick and thin tubes, because it will take the tubes that are thick because that's where the flow is highest. And that's how it's reading out previous information stored in where you have thick or where you have no or thin connections. 
And so that's my little story to tell you that really caring about the network hierarchy is important because it shows you that you can store information about the history of events. We can actually even further store that the information is precisely stored where tubes are vanishing and not persist anymore. To also break um, the news, so we actually know that indeed it's the shear force uh, that's governing the local dynamics of tubes in Fazarum. It's a delay, um, but uh, it's much more complicated in the context that uh, actually tube fate uh, depends on a specific position in the network um, compared to its surrounding uh, network environment. We're also studying network topology for the question was uh, for robustness and how network topology also influences function and metabolic cost and the partitioning of metabolic cost. And we're interested in you know, how to control network function um, and increase transport flux absorption via these networks, uh, you know, the principles of self-organized optimization. Um, maybe just a quick highlight, uh, you know, think about the multitudes of flow networks um, that we have in our body. There's not just a vasculature, you know, you can keep going down that list, the intestines, the lymph system. And this is just in, an, in a living animal. So there's a lot of flow networks that we need to study. And so I believe at first we also need to use physics to understand and combine with experiments. And obviously also, you know, synthetic organ printing requires us to have this knowledge. Thank you. Fantastic. So we have time for some questions. Um, Jennifer Lupin Cut Schwartz has a question that I, I, maybe it's easier if she could come. Could you, Jennifer, could you just come on screen and ask your question? Sure. Yeah. Karen, that was a really great talk. Um, I am a, I study subcellular organelles, and there's one organelle that is a very anastomizing tubular network, and that's endoplasmic reticulum. And to my knowledge, it does not show this type of Murray law. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm curious as to how you, yet it's filled with all kinds of metabolic, you know, material. Mm -hmm. So how would you explain that? It has, so, you know, very yeah. similar, you know, mm -hmm. elaborations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The Murray law best holds for networks where you really have a, a unidirectional flow. Um, so you have like one inlet and then multiple outlets. Um, this is where it holds best. Um, so for example, also in Fazarum, we observed that there we have instances um, in its life cycle where Murray's law is actually not uh, observed, uh, obeyed or at least not you know, statistically significant. And then if we trigger it to like, um, you know, form this one like major outgrowth front, for example, then it is perfectly obeyed. So um, the, it, it seems right. like, I mean, Maris law is minimizing the, the dissipative cost of, um, uh, of your flows, but this may not be the utter concern of the network at hand, right? You, you may have different constraints that force your network to be, to be caring much more about like, am I serving all parts of my tissue equally? And, and then, you know, I, I'm willing to invest extra cost of like creating this flow strength um, because this is much, much more important for my purpose. And so well, I think being open-minded and being inspired yeah. by data is important here. Yeah. Cool. So Thank another uh, sort of, I guess, a continuation of, of this question actually is from Pedro Marquez Zacharias who asks, are there good biological examples of unicellular flow networks and, and, and would memory be different in such a situation or, or other interesting aspects? Um, so we, we're, we're working on this. So um, we now have uh, human, uh, human cell lines that we grow into epithelial um, cell structures on the microfluidic step uh, ship. And we want to see if we can observe uh, memory formation there. Um, so uh, why, I, I can't say from an experiment point, experimental point of view, but um, from theoretical models, if you, you know, take Murray's law and you put this into like shear force adaptation and you formalize this in this mathematical uh, language, then the mathematical language actually shows theoretically that um, shear force adaptation is sufficient to show memory. And it's in the tubes that vanish. So when the tube, because it's, it's a, like the, the physicist would say, like the process has, you know, has no point of return. So if, it, if the tube prunes away, that's where the memory is because it's gone and can't regrow. That, that's, that's how you store it. Okay, so I think that may have also answered Manu Prakash's question, but he wanted you to comment on write versus read aspects of memory. Mm -hmm. And I guess it sounds like, like, like the writing is branch formation and pruning, would that be? 
the writing is uh, like thickening tubes, but it's actually the crew name. So that's the, that's the key. That's the key in writing. And then um, even if you have like, you know, the network rearranging, if you probe, like in the, at least in the theoretical model, we can actually probe because experimentally you can't, like the network change, you know, irreversibly change. So we can't like do controlled experiments with exactly the same network morphology, right? But um, in, in the theoretical models, we can. And there we really see that, you know, even if, you know, the network rearranged, um, it will react much stronger if the uh, stimulus is presented in the same fashion again, because of these teeny, you know, uh, tubes that are even tinier now. Yeah. And then, um, okay, I think we're actually out of time. Um, there's some more questions in the in the the uh, Q and A, and also I think I may have misspoke when I was a uh, 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 conveying Pedro Marquez Zacharias question. Uh, if I said unicellular, I meant unidirectional, and um, maybe you can further respond to that. So let's thank Karen for another great talk. Applause, please. Okay. And now our, our, our next speaker before the break is Sebastian Streichen from UC Santa Barbara. So hello everyone. Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, so, looks okay. good. Um, thanks a lot for the kind invitation. Um, so uh, in the last few talks from yesterday and today, we've actually seen this enormous variety uh, in terms of forms that you can make with these multicellular aggregates. Um, and of course, this is also reflected at the level of biochemistry, where there's vastly different toolkits being used. Um, but instead of focusing on the differences, uh, I'm trying to see, can we find commonalities? Yeah? And so this was one of the questions that emerged yesterday in the discussion. And what I'm going to try to pitch is basically to say, maybe physics could be the, gl the glue between those different uh, uh, quantities or, or cellular aggregates. And essentially what they have to do is they have to utilize, you know, the fate patterning system that controls by some means uh, force generating processes that sculpt a simple structure into a more elaborate form that is really essential to execute the function of this animal that is going to live or that plant that is going to live. And if you're interested in understanding, you know, um, how this force generating process is going, seeing is believing. So you need to really literally look at the processes and visualize them live at the scale of what you're interested in. So for example, if you're interested in an embryo, you visualize the whole embryo and you you see the dynamics yeah? and you see that there is a large scale tissue flows emerging uh, both in fruit fly embryos, but also in pariala embryos. So cellular flows seem to be sort of everywhere. And the question now becomes how uh, these cellular flows are being controlled. And, you know, that's a question of physics, I would argue. Um, and you need to go to the microscopic scale um, where active processes are present and where, you know, molecular motors are generating forces that are changing the shape. So now you need to bridge scales, right, from microscopic to macroscopic. And this is where, you know, physics is really good at. It can make the connection between those two. And hopefully you can learn uh, the process in this way. And when you've then learned such processes, maybe you can take inspiration and one day in a Petri dish, you know, take cells, put them together in some form so that they build a geometry that is reproducible and robust so that you built towards this kind of fine money and kind of understanding. And that's what I'm trying to tell you a little bit about. So in my group, we use this multi-scale microscopy using light sheet. Um, and, you know, we've developed tools such as Insane that allows us to get quantitative um, descriptions of multiple different observables. So for, for example, what we can do is we can measure cellular flow fields where we can map at every point where the cells are moving. We can do this across the whole surface of the embryo. At the same time, we can go and measure, for example, um, the distribution of molecular motors, and we can see, you know, levels of intensity reflected here. Um, and what you then see is very strikingly, there's a dorsal ventral gradient in this embryo emerging, where on the dorsal side, you have much less molecular motors than on the ventral side. And so you could imagine already some kind of a molecular tug of war, where on one side, you know, uh, there is stronger pulls than on the other, and that could drive this flow. In order to make this a little bit more precise, what we're trying to do is use physical modeling to bridge these two different scales. And these are oftentimes, you know, sort of simple models that are saying, okay, we have a fluid that is driven by forces that are being proportional to gradients in myosin levels. 
The advantage of having such a model is that you can actually get immediately feedback towards the accuracy of understanding of the physical process that you're in. You get a number that tells you, you know, maybe you're able to predict 90% of the flow on the surface from the patterns of myosin that you can measure. And this is the case here. So what this allows you now to do is essentially formulate new kinds of experiments. And these new experiments could, for example, be that you're going to change the field of myosin in a predicted form, in an understandable form. And this model down here, you know, predicts flows that, are should, that should come out of this. Another thing you can do is you can actually utilize these ideas to dive deeper towards the question of how we can connect the fate map to you know, deformations in the embryo. So this is something that we're doing in the lab. We're collecting an atlas of information where we map out dynamically the gene expression patterns that you can see in a fruit fly embryo. Here are all the pair rule genes uh, visualized. And then we also map out cytoskeletal components. And what we try to do is connect you know, these different data sets that are all quantified uh, together using a physical model so that we can predict the time course of myosin from patterns of gene expression, for example in this way trying to connect sort of the bridge from molecules all the way to the form. Once you have such a model, you can propose new kinds of experiments. And the new kinds of experiments we need are ideally dynamic. And what I mean by that is that you can, for example, take Eve stripe number three, transiently turn it off for, say, a minute, bring it back in and study the response of the system that you're trying to model this way. Now, you know, this approach works not only in fruit flies, it also transports to other settings. So here you see, for example, um, Pariala hawaiensis embryos. And thanks to Tassos Pavlopoulos, we now have a culture in the lab where we can actually visualize, you know, the uh, nuclei, how they are moving across the surface of this Pariala embryo. And what you see that there is also a flow, right? And this flow is characterized by, you know, a striking large number of cell divisions that you can see here. And so what Dylan Sislow in the lab did is he essentially tracked all the cells, reconstructed the lineages, looked at the division axes. And what he finds is that early on, these division axes are all dead on parallel to the anterior posterior axis. Now, what we do now is we have essentially a microscopic observation, which is the stresses that are coming from cell divisions. And we have a macroscopic observation, which is this flow field. So we can try to bridge the scale again. And Dylan has characterized those two events, put them together into a model. And surprisingly, the best model that characterizes this flow very well at like 80 to 90% level is mathematically speaking, the same model as the one that we've been using in the fruit fly embryo. Biologically, this is, however, different. Yeah? The stresses in the fruit fly embryo are driven by gradients of myosin. Uh, and in the pariala embryo, we're saying that the stresses are driven due to cell division. Now, that suggests that what biology has learned is to control the same physical process, but it learned it to do it in different ways. And so what we are now at is a situation where we have this fate patterning machinery that obviously controls physical processes like these fluid flows that I've shown you. But how is the big question that we need to get at, right? So for example, uh, it could be that it merely sets up an initial condition for a physical process. And this physical process then runs more or less autonomously until it reaches an equilibrium. It's of course also possible that there are feedback mechanisms that you know basically uh, feedback onto the organization of the cytoskeleton due to forces like Oje was kind of uh, referring to, and maybe even feedback mechanisms that are going into the fate patterning itself from you know the, the mechanics. So the tools that we have in order to explore this are of course the biochemistry toolkit, which is a great thing, but we really need to get towards dynamic perturbations. And I think the best set that we have there for this approach is this non-neuronal optogenetics, which is coming, but it needs to really expand for this approach to have success. Another thing that I find would be interesting is to try and change physical properties. Um, but then another piece that you need to be aware of is initial conditions. And I would argue that embryos have this extraordinary, exquisite control over initial conditions. And that becomes really apparent when you're trying to recapitulate aspects of morphogenesis in a Petri dish. Right? So for example, people are trying to develop organoid protocols for all sorts of organs in the human body. And here are mini brains. Right? So depending on the signaling condition that you uh, provide these stem cells in the 3D culture uh, environment, these cells will differentiate into 
different fates. They will do this also at the right kind of proportions. Um, but when you look at the relative arrangement of those fates and you're looking at the form that these uh, uh, cellular aggregates are building, you see that it's actually not as reliable as what you have in an embryo. So clearly there's something missing. When you're looking at primordia in embryos, you see that these are very well defined in terms of their territory. The cell density is also well defined. And then you're executing this very reproducible process of shape changes. So the thing that we've been thinking about is maybe um, it is the initial condition that one needs to control better for these physical processes to be executed. And this is what we set out together with Eyal Karsbrun and Amul Kankel in the lab. And by the way, Eyal here is currently on the job market. So if you're interested in what we're doing, I encourage you to contact him. So basically what we have is we have a Petri dish and we want to control an initial condition. The way that we do this is we define micro patterned areas on which we can seed cells. This is now a monolayer of cells at some known density. And we are squirting matri gel on top of this culture so that it undergoes a topological transition. What you see now is a, a cylinder where you essentially have a monolayer of stem cells surrounding a common lumen with an apical surface facing inwards. You can differentiate those cells. Here we do neuronal induction plus BMP. And what you see by day six is pattern formation. So you see a neural epithelium forming here in red surrounded by epidermis. And by day seven, you observe that at the interface of this neural epithelium and the epidermis, there's actually morphogenesis occur. And this morphogenesis is characterized by the neural epithelium thickening. Then it undergoes bending, folding, and closure. So this looks very similar to processes that you would observe inside, you know, a, a, a developing embryo, for example. So uh, we can try to you know, characterize this, of course, in, in, in more detail. So here you can see cross sections through uh, our culture. So you see in the center, there is a population of neural epithelium, which has a lumen on the inside, the apical surface points in there. And then there is a basal basal contact with epidermis. The epidermis is kind of squamous type cells that are shown here in light blue. And you look in the virus cross sections, you see this thing is completely closed. You can repeat, you know, this kind of growth condition within the dish many different times. So you can define many different stripes and you see that these structures are developing at a remarkable level of reproducibility. They always form this kind of long lumen towards the inside. And you can ask yourself, okay, how reproducible is it? And you see that it's about 90% within dish, but also across dishes. And then a natural question to ask would be, okay, what are the fates of those cells, right? So you can go and take those cells now and put them to single cell sequencing. And what you will find are markers that, you know, label for the surface ectoderm, they label for neural ectoderm, but also for neural crest, for example. And you can then image the spatial distribution of those. And what you find is that the neural crest actually sits in the right place. It's, you know, emerging at the interface between epidermis and neurons. And so with that thing, we're now going towards uh, uh, new directions, right? So for example, what we could say is we have some kind of a model process for aspects of neural tube morphogenesis. So what we could do now in a Petri dish is ask, what are the genetic players that drive morphogenesis in this petri dish event and there find candidates then that we could study in an embryo. The advantage of this approach is that you get large sample numbers um, and you have, you know, this exquisite control of cell culture. So you can change the conditions. You could even grow this in a 96 well plate and parallelize uh, very fast. And last but not least, but very important, you know, you get access to uh, physical measurements. So now you could go and measure, for example, traction forces if you wanted to. And then this allows you to dream now, right? So basically we looked at embryos, we learn what are the physical processes that are occurring within these embryos. Um, you know, it looks like it might be possible to, you know, make structures appear in a Petri dish. Um, now the question becomes, one day, can we actually learn how to program morphogenesis and maybe get towards synthetic morphogenesis? And with that, I would like to thank uh, the people that I have the pleasure of working with. Uh, um, I definitely want to highlight Eyal Karsbun, um, who is a phenomenal postdoc. Um, and I want to point out, you know, funding as well as the Santa Barbara Advanced School of Quantitative Biology, if uh, some of you guys are interested in coming. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, there's a question from Vad Perez who asks, um, 
so would morphogenesis be be altered under different external physical conditions such as at, in space when there's no gravity but also you know maybe at, at great depth under the ocean for example um well so i guess the morphogenesis happens usually in some sort of an environment that you know defines pretty good chemistry right so this is how an embryo sort of is isolated from um, um, chemically from its rest. So I'm not quite sure whether, uh, uh, you know, growing stem cells in under the ocean, you know, is going to make them survive. Yeah, we need to cope. Well, I mean, there are animals that develop under the ocean. So, so I mean, yeah, I mean, you would need to be chemically sort of uh, uh, have the compatibility, right? So, so, and, and in, in, in the, um, Outer space, you know, I mean, vacuum, you know, so no, no, not the vacuum. It's, it, it's referring to, to, he's referring to, to, to low gravity. Low and I'm referring gravity. to hydrostatic pressure, not not salt water or something like that. Oh, I see. Okay, so low gravity. Well, I think gravity is probably something that doesn't play a huge role in this process, right? So what we have here is, uh, you know, interactions between proteins and those proteins, you know, are attracting one another through electric forces, which probably win over gravity, I would argue. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, I think there are examples where, well, anyway, um, I had a question, which is, there's these classic experiments where people block cytokinesis in Drosophila and you still get the stripes of perirule expression. Mm -hmm. So, so have, have you ever looked at, at what happens to the mechanics if you don't have the cell membranes there and it's all just one yeah. big sensation? Is mechanics basically the same? Yeah, so so basically what you're referring to is acellular embryos, you know, where you just have 6,000 nuclei sitting in the uh, surface. And, and you know, there are certain aspects of the gastrulation that are occurring in this acellular embryo. Uh, to some extent, you know, it does germ band extension but then it fails to move back. And that's actually a really interesting question in terms of what are the physical conditions that those cells are having, right? So for example, one thing that we see in our models is that there's aerial incompressibility, right? And maybe that is what is, you know, afforded by the cytoskeleton, right? By the apical surface cytoskeleton and by the cells being encapsulated. Uh, now we know have closed volume bags and we can't, you know, have the water leave that surface anymore and it becomes incompressible. And that, of course, you know, hugely affects how the physics is executed within those cells. Great. So I think we're out of time for, for questions. There's a few more questions in the chat among the panelists. So I would urge you, Sebastian, please take a look at those. Let's thank Sebastian and uh, for a wonderful talk. And now we have let's, virtual applause, very unsatisfying on Zoom, I know. And now I think we have a, a, a short break. So um, our next speaker will be Flora Rudiganir from UC Berkeley. Okay, how does that look in terms of hearing me and screen? Everything's perfect. Great. Um, so I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to contribute to this session as a speaker. Um, I'm a postdoc in Professor Nicole King's lab with some chemistry background, new to cell biology, um, and I'm interested in kind of inspiring hopefully some discussion about uh, probing the origin of nutrient sensing in animals. So specifically work that I've been doing recently in Nicole King's lab has started to drive questions about what happens in terms of nutrient signaling. And you're talking about being able to sense nutrients as an individual, and then how does that change when nutrient sensing needs to happen as a group? And does it matter that if individuals within the group are genetically identical or if they're distinct? And then kind of increasing in complexity, what happens when you have organisms that have collections of groups that need to communicate with each other in order uh, to sense nutrient status. And so in the case of an individual, we've learned a lot about nutrient sensing by looking at what happens uh, to organisms uh, such as bacteria uh, that are able to sense when they're directly uh, in a nutrient rich environment um, and they are able to coordinate their movement accordingly to bias themselves to stay within that environment. Um, and then when they're in areas where nutrient is scarce, um, are able to bias their movement in order to tumble um, and forage for new nutrient sources. When we look at organisms that have transient multicellular behavior, um, and yesterday, Alison Sigro had a great example of Dictyostelium um, that's able to uh, kind of have these aggregative multicellular communities that drive cyclic AMP signaling. We see the rise of second messengers um, in these transient multicellular phenotypes playing a large role. And so in the case of Dictyostelium, bold change is able to be sensed, um, and that drives kind of collective behavior amongst genetically distinct um, individuals. And then in the case of myxobacteria and uh, budding yeast, we're also able to see second messengers play a prominent role. 
Um, and so when we go to organisms that are obligately multicellular, such as uh, humans and other animals, uh, plants, uh, land plants, excuse me, and then uh, fungi, we see the role of hormones and growth factor signaling playing a dominant role in com communicating nutrition level um, and nutrient excuse me, nutrient status um, across the organism. And so I'm highlighting here the kind of growth factors that promote this uh, information. Um, but additionally, with these growth factors, there's also receptors that bind specifically to individual growth factors. And these organisms are able to coordinate the expression of specific receptors that recognize these molecules and maybe have some sort of tissue specificity to really coordinate you know, which groups of cells are communicating with each other across the organism. And so to look uh, specifically at the evolution of nutrient sensing in animals, I've been working with coenoflagellates, which are the closest living group, of, uh, sorry, excuse me, the closest uh, living unicellular relatives to animals, um, and looking at what genes coenoflagellates have and hopefully moving towards um, having protein function um, characterized within this organism. And so as mentioned previously yesterday, um, the sequencing of coenoflagellates and other close uh, unicellular relatives to animals has happened about more than a decade ago now. Um, and then with those uh, sequencing efforts, we were able to appreciate um, several things. One is that the, a lot of the unicellular relatives to animals have a lot of genes that we consider important um, in animals. And so shown here is a graph of the number of publications of human genes of the top uh, 1,000. And you can see that there is a distribution of popularity in genes that we study in animal systems due to our own biases, um, but that a lot of these unicellular relatives to animals actually have a lot of these genes conserved. And so what's important for us as, as people that are studying model systems is that you know, we can use these systems to gain understanding in genes that are not well studied in current animal systems, but we can also use the these unicellular relatives to animals as comparative approaches to study the evolution of protein function um, when we do have high conservation and a lot of um, knowledge within the animal systems. Um, and so in terms of nutrient sensing, kind of broadly across eukaryotes, we've seen a conservation of core regulatory uh, proteins that are necessary to um, convey nutrient status within individuals, such as the AMPK, TOR, and GCN2 signaling pathways. And I, I mentioned this to say that I think in our efforts to do experimental evolution, we can have some confidence that these types of efforts would work in terms of nutrient sensing, um, because eukaryotes broadly are able to process information about nutrient status similarly, and in some cases uh, for specific types of signaling, such as the cyclic AMP case with dictyostelium, that type of signaling is coordinated so you can have signaling that's recognized by individuals within the context of a larger group um, and information that is conveyed as a group level um, kind of signaling output compa compared to just a cell autonomous uh, kind of, yes, compared to just a unicellular uh, approach to say, sensing a signal. Um, and then when we look at uh, growth factor signaling and, and, and uh, other uh, growth factor, growth promoting signals um, in animals and, and in land plants and fungi, we see something really interesting in terms of the receptors that are expressed within these obligately multicellular organisms in that a lot of uh, things that we find important uh, for animals such as growth hormone receptor and receptor tyrosine kinase signaling um, and GPCRs are present within the obligately multicellular organisms. And we see hints of these receptors present in the unicellular relatives to these obligately multicellular lineages. However, um, this is so far mainly just done on a you know, gene presence basis, but there hasn't been as much effort done to actually confirm that the function of these genes are actually homologous to what we see within the obligately multicellular lineages. And so the work that I've been doing in Nicole King's lab is specifically focused on receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. And we can perhaps have some discussion about why particular receptors have been chosen in different lineages to be important in terms of maintaining obligate multicellularity, if that is truly the case. Um, but um, I think that this highlights really that, you know, we see the origin of these receptors before multicellularity arises as something that's necessary um, and kind of highlights the importance of maybe identifying what signals actually uh, promote or what signals are actually recognized by these receptors and whether or not that interaction actually plays a role within the origin of multicellularity. Um, and so 
uh, using quinoflagellates has been great because it's uh, the system has emerged as a tractable system. And so starting with the genome sequencing efforts uh, that were done a little bit more than a decade ago, and now being able to finally manipulate uh, the system within the laboratory, as well as genetic techniques and microscopy techniques, we really are now able to assess the function of individual proteins within these organisms and see whether or not they're truly functionally homologous in addition to being present within these organisms. Um, and so one additional point that I would like to, to bring up before I address some challenges with working with this system is that uh, recent efforts within the King Lab to generate transcriptomes of many quinoflagellates has actually appreciated a pretty broad diversity just within quinoflagellates alone. Um, and so in terms of my goals towards understanding what the roles of receptor signaling are, uh, we can see likely um, you know, patterns that are shared between quinoflagellates and animals, and then likely also patterns that are just important for quinoflagellates themselves. And so this has been a little bit apparent from looking at uh, the sequences of receptor tyrosine kinases and that we see some homology of few receptors with animal receptor tyrosine kinases, but there's also a bunch of receptor tyrosine kinases that have very unique domains that seem to be present only within quinoflagellates and other unicellular relatives to animals. Um, and so uh, in addition to having a broad range of species of, of quinoflagellates present, they also come from very distinct sources. And so here is some recent field sampling that's been done in the King Lab to identify new species. And then uh, a quinoflagellate kind of colony formation is also very different amongst quinoflagellates, which has also been really interesting. And so Salpinga Eco Rosetta, which is the main system we use in the lab, we're able to control the multicellular transition. Um, and we can compare what those colonies look like to another quinoflagellate, Barrowica monocera, which was isolated from an extreme environment, Mono Lake. Um, and then also more recently, uh, the uh, identification of Quinoica flexa uh, from a splash pool in Curacao. And so I think also the environment from which these organisms are isolated points towards some unique uh, biology that is currently not explored in terms of what are these organisms sensing in their environment and what does that do to influence their biology and does that contribute to the multicellular phenotypes that we're seeing. And so talking about some of the hurdles, um, and so quinoflagellates um, share some biology with sponges in that they're bacteriovores, and so bacteria are their main nutrient source. Um, and so this is great because that's shared biology with an animal system that's relevant for us to study. However, it's also a difficulty in that we've not been able to culture quinoflagellates azenically. And so we're able to identify signals uh, from bacteria that influence their behavior that have really potent effects that kind of layer are layered on top of bacteria that we already use in culture. Um, but we're not able to kind of assess what are the direct nutrients that the quinoflagellates are getting from their main bacterial prey. So I think efforts to kind of get towards exenic culturing would be helpful. Um, in cultures that we are currently growing in the lab, we also see differences in nutrient starvation. And so there's this well-fed slow swimmer state that we see that transitions into a fast swimmer state, um, but that happens kind of differently across the culture. And so there's potential for some stochasticity in terms of nutrient sensing within the culture. Um, and I'd like to see if we can get more towards that, that question by efforts to synchronize the culture. Um, and lastly, I think in terms of looking at, you know, what are the signals that are necessary for these organisms? And what do those signals mean in terms of the environments that we're getting them from um, is an effort hopefully to move towards metabolomics and, and hopefully lean towards our colleagues that are working um, within the microbiome type efforts to catalog what, uh, you know, molecules are being made, what molecules are being sensed, um, and then I think this would also kind of coordinate really well with uh, recent approaches that are, are going on, such as this recent center uh, funded by the NSF uh, for kind of cataloging chemical currencies within the ocean. And so connecting, you know, what these molecules look like in the environment um, compared to what they look like in the lab, because my guess is that, you know, we're growing a lot of these organisms with signals that are maybe at full difference concentrations in culture compared to what we actually see in the environment. And so it'd be nice to, to get some sense of relevance in terms of the signals that, that we're looking at. Um, and so lastly, I'll leave uh, you know, two open questions that I'm looking at directly, which is, you know, were growth regulating pathways uh, kind of more established before multicellularity was, was originated? And are these pathways necessary for maintenance of the multicellular state? Um, and for the second question, I think we can also lean on current efforts by uh, colleagues that are working at on, on 
diseases in animals where multicellularity goes wrong, such as cancer. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank the, the King Lab and I'm glad, uh, happy to answer any questions anyone have and also thank the symposium organizers for the invite to speak. Great, thanks. So we do have some time for questions. Maybe I could start. So in thinking about a unicellular organism, it has to sense its environment outside the cell, but also the state inside the cell. When you go to multicellular, now you have a cell that's sensing metabolic state in the whole organism. Is there, a, can you tell at this point, is, if you have a consensus view about, is that switch to, is that, is that basically rewiring mechanisms that would have been used to sense external environment by unicellular, or is it taking mechanisms that the unicell would have used to sense its internal environment and then externalizing them by linking on a receptor? Yeah, I think current, at least my current reading is that we think that it's kind of a layering approach and reorganization of signaling that already exists. So when you think about the addition of growth factor signaling, you know, similar intracellular pathways are still used, but then you have this additional layer of a growth factor, which is like, okay, are you able to actually take on this nutrient. And then that kind of kind of is a, like a, a gate essentially into whether or not, you know, you can actually sense the nutrient or not. And so my guess is that by kind of looking at quinoflagellates and what these signals are doing is that we're going to kind of get this layered approach, um, hopefully emerging. Um, and I think especially comparisons with sponges that seem to have more of this growth factor signaling retained. So they respond to things like VEGF, which we don't see with quinoflagellates. It'd be interesting to see kind of, you know, where that happened specifically. Yes, for sure. And then there's a question from Ria Samantha, which is, are there quinoflagellates that live in extreme environments? And can you uh, learn something about nutrient sensing under those conditions? Yeah, and so one of the ones that I popped up on the slide, which was Berwicka monosierra, is isolated from Mono Lake. So con compared to the traditional quinoflagellate system that we use, which is typically around a pH um, of eight, um, and Mono Lake, that's a pH of about nine. So we're looking at a full difference there. Um, and then additionally, um, this is an e even more hypersaline environment. And so there's probably something about, you know, the, the proteins that are used within Berwicka monosierra that's maybe slightly different from other quinoflagellate species. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of work that can be done in comparing um, across different quinoflagellates uh, cell signaling processes. Any more questions anyone has? Because I, I can ask another, I have another one, which is always, this, so this is, I, I know sort of beyond the scope of your talk, but it's always puzzled me why like in humans, you have certain nutrients like glucose are sensed at an organismal level with insulin, but others like cholesterol are sensed on a per cell basis. Can you speculate about why, why you know, different nutrients have different levels of, 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 of sort of cell autonomy into their sensing? I mean, that's a great question. The like chemist in me is gonna lean towards maybe things about membrane, you know, flu fluids being important. So whether or not things are retained in membranes such as cholesterol is probably something specific to an individual cell, whether compared to things that are, you know, able to enter into circulation, probably being more important for the organism. Um, but yeah, that's just a speculation on my part. No, that, 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 that makes a lot of that. sense. Um, Manu, we'll take one more very quick question from Manu and then we'll move on. Yeah, just very quickly, I think I um, I love the fact that you connected uh, things back to the environment. And I'm just curious, is there a game plan on uh, quantitatively measuring concentrations in an environmental context and in a culture context to know that this is physiologically at this concentration operating in the environment as a signaling mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I would... I would love to see that approach personally um, done. Um, I don't think that there are currently any efforts to do that. I know chemical ecologists are very interested in kind of understanding what are things like in the natural environment, but I don't know of any efforts to connect, you know, that effort with what are things going on in the research laboratory. And I think that that would be pretty critical in terms of assessing whether or not what we're looking at in the lab is actually physiologically relevant um, in terms of the native habitat, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I see, sorry, Will, I know you have a hand up, but we, we're really out of time for questions. So uh, Will, if you could ask your question in the chat and there are additional questions in the, in the, in the Q&A box, Flora, if you could uh, get a chance to address those too. All right, so let's thank Flora for a great talk, virtual applause. And then our last speaker in this, in, in this first session will be Stefania Kaspataki from Arizona State. Uh, I just thought, share my screen. Um... Mm. OK. 
Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Yes, we see it. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, whatever you are. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to present today. And thank you all for coming to listen to my presentation, which is going to be about uh, the evolution of multicellularity in algae. And this work was mostly conducted uh, during my master's and PhD degree at Oxford. Um, so just to give you an overall framework, uh, there's a common framework we can use to understand how and why obligate multicellular organisms have evolved. Um, and in 2011, specifically, Andrew Burke introduced this framework where we have single cells that um, then kind of form a multicellular group. And the, the next step, the final step, is this group transformation into a higher level multicellular organism, as he called it. Um, and in this presentation, I'll mostly focus on this first step of multicellular group formation, and I'll explain everything about how freshwater green algae um, form groups in response to predators and how do they do that and why do they do it. Okay, so first, just to give you an introduction about the prey I have been using. So on the left are the different prey species I've been using, like different um, freshwater algae like Chlorella sorokiniana, Chlorella vulgaris and Synodesmus obliquus. And on the top, I have the different predators or Cremonis trohymena. And one of the largest predators in our um, experiments was Daphnia magna. And what I did is I measured clumping over time. And so for example, this uh, black line is our control where we have no predators. So without the predators, the algae are mostly in a single celled state. But when we add the predators, uh, we see lots of uh, grouping happening. So the algae start forming groups, and we actually see this in all of our nine predator-prey combinations. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about this uh, panel here on the top right, which seems to have the strongest effect. So you can see that the algae kind of form group groups like very, very quickly, like within 24 hours, and very large groups as well. Like there's a very high proportion of cells in groups uh, here relative to the other combinations. And I'll show you in the next few slides um, that these groups are so large that we can even see them with the naked eye. Uh, like here on the left is like our control without the predators. But on the right here, we see the predators. I mean, the, the algae where we've added the predators. And you can see all these uh, green dots, which are the algae that form the groups. And we can actually see the Daphne as well, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, of about seven Daphne in this picture. Um, and when we were writing this paper and preparing it to, to submit, um, people were saying, well, this group and behavior might be because the predators, it might be because of the movement of the predators. So to address the argument, we also did these experiments by just using predator supernatant. So again, here on the left, we have the control without the predator supernatant. And on the right, we have the algae where we added predator supernatant. Uh, predator supernatant just means that we use filtered water from the tank where the Daphnia were growing. Uh, so any kind of predator cues. Um, and so again, we see essentially lots of different, lots of small dots, which are the algae that have clumped in response to the predator supernatant. Um, and so we've seen so far that um, algae can form groups, but how do they actually do this? Uh, what can we, what do we know about the mechanism? Uh, so we found that the, these algae form groups both by aggregating and by remaining together with their neighboring cells after cell division. And in the bibliography, this is called, um, this is either semi-social group formation or sub-social group formation. Um, and just to give you a bit of a background about the experiment here in the middle of the slide, um, we started with a, with a culture of algae, um, which we split into two different cultures, and we, um, we dyed one culture, culture green, the other one um, violet, uh, fluorescent dyes. We removed the dyes, and then we mixed the two algal cultures. We added the predator supernatant, and we finally saw these groups. Um, and so this group on the top shows us clearly that it's aggregation because it's different colored colors of cells coming together. But here on the bottom, we don't exactly know whether this is aggregation or subsocial group formation. 
you can imagine that could be like different um, different green cells also coming together by aggregation. So to address that point, we also did like time lapse photography. Um, so here on the right is a video, which if we have time, I'll show you. But the most important is here on the right. Uh, it's a single cell that starts dividing. Uh, yeah, and you can see at the end that the daughter cells have all stuck together, uh, which is an example of sub, sub social group formation in these algae. OK, I have to move on. Um, so we know how these algae form groups, and then I, I asked how they actually form these groups, because we noticed that in several different experiments that these groups uh, actually degrade in the sense that they break up over time. Um, and we, we've seen this in well, chlorella, chlorokiniana, chlorella vulgaris, um, and in Senadesmus obliquus, and different, um, different papers report this. Uh, so given that these groups kind of break apart, we're thinking, well, it seems to be costly to be in a group. So how can we, can we quantify this cost? Um, yeah, is it moving? Oh, here we are. No, fuck. Um, and, well, what is it? Yeah. So we used four different treatments. Um, light means that the cultures were grown in 16 hours of light versus eight hours of darkness. Dark means that we covered the cultures, the tubes with aluminium foil uh, to kind of simulate very dark conditions. And again, the same conditions here on the right. But here on the left, we have added Daphnia supernatant, whereas here we haven't. So as we um, expected from the things I showed you previously, uh, the cultures with the Daphnia supernatant formed groups. Uh, whereas here we see that the proportion of cells in groups is very low without the Daphnia supernatant. And I want you to focus mostly here now. We have a culture that is multicellular, multicellular, um, and this one is unicellular. But this one, as you can see, the total number of algae has dropped dramatically in comparison to that one. Uh, so it seems that there's a cost to being in a multicellular group uh, under these limited uh, resources in the sense of darkness. Um, so we found, uh, okay, so we found the cost. Now what's the benefit? How can we, can we quantify that? Um, so first we looked at the, um, how, whether we could quantify the benefit of group formation in response to these small predators or Cremonas. So Cremonas is this um, cell here, and you can see that it's interacting with the group of algal cells and can see the single cells nearby. But essentially, I want you to focus on these two treatments here. We have a unicellular algal culture and a multicellular algal culture. Um, and you can see here that um, in this treatment, the total number of algae has dropped when we have added the predators. Whereas here in the multicellular culture, the total number of algae is still quite high. So this shows us that probably in this culture, the algae have been predated, they've been eaten by the predator. Whereas here, and when the algae are in a multicellular state, they kind of um, have an advantage in the sense that they, they don't get eaten by the predator. However, I'll show you now what happens with a larger predator, the Daphnia. This is just a video to show you like the comparison in sizes. Uh, so Daphnia is much larger than the green dots of algae. And you can even see this um, being big clump of algae, which is, in the upper side of the gastrointestinal tract of the Daphnia. Um, and just to show you like the similar plots to here, you can see here the multicellular uh, treatment, uh, the total algae has, the total number of algae has kind of dropped dramatically and it's almost similar to the unicellular treatment. So no matter if the algae are in a multicellular or single cell state, they seem to get eaten by the Daphnia. And we see the sim a similar effect when we try different sizes of Daphnia, like they, the algae still get eaten, even if they're in a unicellular or multicellular uh, state, no matter the size of the Daphnia. Um, so I, I'll tell you a bit more, maybe if we have time later about what I'm thinking about, what is the advantage of forming a multicellular group when you're exposed to a very large predator? Uh, maybe there's some other advantages. But just to conclude, uh, I've kind of explained how algae form groups in response to predators. Uh, they form these groups semi-socially and sub-socially. And there's also costs and benefits related to this group formation, especially when the algae are exposed to small predators. 
Uh, and I have here just a list of thoughts for future directions. Like I know in this workshop, we've been talking a lot about the mechanism and integrating comparative genetics and epigenetics. This whole story that I explained, it'd be great if we could find some kind of cellular markers of stickiness and the group inducing chemicals that are involved here. And we could even try some experimental evolution with the chlorella algae. Um, and I'm thinking some of the discussion we had yesterday as well about merging genomics with larger scale ecology, like if we could in, use more um, predator and prey species to see how they all interact together and whether we still still see this clumping behavior. Um, I think I'm, yes, I'm done. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. All right, great. We have quite a few questions coming up. So uh, Buzzbaum asks whether you think maybe um, Daphne has actually deliberately, has evolved to deliberately induce clumping to make it easier to eat. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I, I mean, thinking about that picture where the, the clump was actually inside the intestine of the Daphne, it could be. And I had some other experiments I did, which I didn't show, which shows that the algae can actually survive in the guts of the Daphne. And they can actually, I mean, even after the Daphne has died, they still reproduce. But I, I'm not sure what could they could be doing. I don't, they could use like Daphne as a, a wow. plane to go to different places. I don't know. Wow, so, uh, so so the predator becomes the prey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so very cool. Um, Amy Gladfelter asked whether it, um, when, when the algae become these multicellular groups, do you see more variability at the single cell level than you would see if they were just individually growing, like at the gene expression level or anything anything measurable? Yeah, the thing is we didn't like measure any uh, anything related to genomics. Like it was, the problem with these algae, as far as I know, especially with Chlorella sorokiniana, there's not much known in terms of its genetics and molecular pathways and all those things. Like, I w ideally, like with the Volvocyne algae, it's much better because we know much more. But yeah, in the future, it would be great to kind of integrate lots of quantitative measurements of these things, yeah. And uh, Manu Prakash asked, what, you know, what, what are the limits? So if you look at other eukaryotes, um, is, there, is there a size limit? To Actually, Manu, I'm not really sure I understand. Can you ask your question? I'm not sure I get what the question is. Yeah, I'm just curious in terms of uh, for Daphne, uh, you didn't see that uh, size dependent predation, but for single cell, which might be the more common predators, is there any advantage in the context of size? This is commonly seen in plankton for feeding with really spiky plankton arising so that zooplankton can't eat them, or that's the theory. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, at least for these in the Desmos obliquus, I mean, we didn't do any experimental evolution in the sense that we exposed the, the algae to predators over several generations. It was just like three or four days. So I didn't, I wouldn't expect anything to evolve so quickly. Only plastic responses. Um, but so this, I'm thinking that you mentioned some, uh, that spiky response of the algae. I remember there's some relatives of Cynodesmus. Uh, so this one that we were using, doesn't have any spikes, but I assume if we exposed it for many generations to these Daphnia, they might evolve some kind of spiky behavior. Uh, and what I meant to ask was in your other eukaryotic unicellular predators, were they able to also effectively feed uh, on these clumps or was there a decay? Uh, no, I, I, ha I don't have an indication, any indication that they were feeding on the clumps. Like, I have some videos showing that the, um, the ciliate, the, the ciliate, no, yeah, the tetrahymena uh, could eat the single cells. Like I actually saw it ingest in one, uh, but I couldn't, I didn't see anything like of in, ingesting like a big clump. Um, have to try stentor. What? Have to try stentor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so um, we have a question from Wen Ying Shou, and this is actually the quintessential Wen Ying Shou question, I, I feel, which is, can different species of, of algae clump together with each other and I guess thereby help each other to avoid being eaten? Yeah, well, we also saw that. Yeah, I, I didn't have time to show it. But in those fluorescent experiments, we, we um, fluorescently dyed one species with violet and the other one with green. And we saw like green and violet clumps. So in, in the specific species we, we investigated, we did, we did see that. Um, so yeah, like different species, cooperation, that was, yeah. Uh, and so, so uh, great. And so uh, Omaya Dudin asked what I think we're all wondering, you know, what is the, what is the chemical cue? And I, and I, and I saw that, you know, you, you, that's something to work on, but I wonder, do you know anything about it? Like, for example, if the Daphnia were starved first, like, are they, are, are the algae sensing 
like pooped out dead algae. It's like if humans are walking down the street and they see a pile of skulls, they'll take on a more defensive posture. You know, what do you, do you know anything yeah. at all about what the queue is like? Yeah, I know like a, some work from a college Robert, uh, coll colleague, um, Roberta Fisher. She did some experiments um, using uh, filtered water just from Daphnia that was starved or Daphnia and algae water or just algae water. Um, if I remember correctly, she saw like a grouping behavior response when she used the, both Daphnia and algae water and just Daphnia water, but not when she used just algae water, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, I, didn't, I didn't try that out. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it would go down to the direction of trying to find the actual chemical cue. There's lots of, I, there's lots of other experiments like um, saying that there's some actual hydrocarbons produced by the Daphnia. I can't remember, remember the exact chemical. But they, there is some work that for some of these species, I think it's either for Chlorella vulgaris or Senedesmus, they've, they've actually found the chemical that induces the group formation that's produced from the Daphnia. Um, okay, so, so we're getting there. So, yeah. so uh, th there's a number of more questions both in the, in the chat and the Q&A, so please uh, take a look at, at those. Okay, so let's, let's thank Stefania for a great talk, more virtual applause. And uh, let's actually thank all, all the speakers from this morning session. More virtual applause for a great, great um, time. And now we're going to go into uh, a panelist discussion period. And so um, what we'd hope to do in this discussion is try to synthesize some, some of the lessons that, that we've learned. Um, and it's a little bit hard to do that, I guess, because there's I, I, think, I feel like the, the two big themes we have here are chemical communication and mechanical communication. And I wonder if anyone, do we have any thoughts about why you might choose one versus another in, in, in different situations? That might be one way to just get the ball rolling. Actually, I have a question for everyone, actually. So mechanics, I mean, it's obviously, I mean, we, we know examples actually that we use it actually to build the organisms, but, the, but it's also used for communication, right? So the question then is like, why do you need chemical communication at all? Actually, if you can do everything mechanically. <laughs> Actually, Manu has a very nice, uh, very nice set of papers actually coming out on exactly that, on like, like having actually organisms actually kind of compute mechanical, uh, mechanically. But uh, so, so I'm trying to, to, to understand this in a different way. I mean, if you can communicate with mechanics or you can communicate with biochemistry and um, what are the features of each one that enable to do different things? Maybe it's just robustness, right? Like you, you know, you want to have things work, so you make sure that you have two different ways of how it can work. So what you're saying actually then that you have a redundant system and you encode it mechanically and you encode it biochemically. I don't, I don't know of many examples of that, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's... I, I would argue actually it's, uh, it's separation of time scales. Uh, to point, really yeah. be able to encode information in different time scales allows you to operate completely differently. And at that same time, that also induces a class of memory. It's a temporal memory in the system that you can operate fast on something. Uh, you have another time scale that's encoding a class of information. And then you can actually reiterate and feedback just purely from separation of time scales. I mean, this is a theoretical idea that we are exploring. And I think it would be really valuable to find model systems to compare this very quantitatively. We have some ideas, but I think the spirit of those three papers is to layer chemistry on top of it eventually. And some of it may just be historical contingency. You have different knobs by which it's, you know, evolving multicellular groups can sort of tweak and get outcomes that are adaptive. And some of those, you know, different lineages have different chemical potential for communication, uh, different biomechanical potential for how stress is propagated. If you have a rigid cell wall versus a soft cell wall, et cetera. So, I mean, I think, I think you guys are right that there's, there are high level organizational properties which benefit either or, but I think some of it too might just be, you get things early on that are important and they just kind of get baked in by, by, you know, evolution. It's totally yeah, not that we're on this you know, question. Sorry, let I guess, me just you know, reply you could, to my, go ahead. You, you could essentially, you know, think also not only about separation of timescales, but also about the 
right control of the physical process, right? What I mean by this is physical processes are oftentimes, you know, symmetry breaking, right? Spontaneously, for example, buckling. And that might be something that is catastrophic to an organism. If you want to have the mesoderm on one side and not on the other side, uh, you're going to be in big trouble if you make this spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. Whereas if you use now chemical signaling to force the physics into one direction, uh, then you're getting very robust. Um, yeah, yeah, I think in uh, terms of, uh, no, go ahead. Go go. ahead. In terms of like, you know, signaling and, and distance, I think that that also likely plays a role. So concentration gradients and then also long range signaling probably gives some chemical advantage to compared to a mechanical uh, advantage. But yeah, I mean, I also agree that they're likely very interconnected, especially when you start to think about things like adhesion that is also kind of both initiated by mechanical stimuli and then also promoted through chemical stimuli. Uh, Keiko, you had a point. Uh, yeah, so this comes to the plant, um, plant uh, higher plant point of view, but a plant cell divides by uh, making the cell plate in the middle, right? Instead of having a cleavage furrow. So there's something called like a minimal energy rule that they like to make because of the physics to locate the cell wall, a uh, cell plate to divide the cell at the where the cell shape to have the minimal energy to divide cell into two cells. And, but when that happens during the context of asymmetric cell division, sometimes they make mistake and, or sometimes they have to form the cell plate against the minimal energy that requires much more energy so that they can make a specialized type of division to make a specialized tissue layer, for instance. And for those actually, cell-cell uh, -cell communication and chemical signaling plays a very important role to making sure the cell plate forms against the physics. So, um, I think chemical communication could play a pretty critical role when organism has to do pattern formation against the minimal required energy and against the mechanical forces to make sure that the pattern resists to those kind of uh, uh, external uh, force or physical environment. Manu, coming back to your point actually about the about the skills, actually it's a very good point actually. Uh, in in yeast actually we've we've now known for some time actually that, so you know there is a separation of time scales in yeast, for instance, they grow at time scales of minutes to tens of minutes, right? Whereas the molecular machinery is working much faster. And we have this, there are these stress sensors in the wall actually, and there is a mechanical feedback. We've done that in, in, in batting yeast. And there's this mechanical feedback actually comes from the cell wall. And the key point is that if you don't have the separation of time scales, and this is actually important, it comes, the concept comes from control systems and engineering. If you don't have a separation of time scales, you cannot control your system very well. It's like having the thermostat that you have at home, like the, the temperature, right? Imagine a system that is reading at the same time scales that you're changing, you cannot control well. So you need a, a, a feedback control that is faster. So you need to separate the time scales. And we are seeing similar things in development. So it could be the separation of time scales is to ensure robustness so that you can keep control systems uh, running properly. Um, Amy Gladfelter was, was making a point about, about whether we can really even separate mechanics and chemistry. Would you be able to come on onto the mic and to lead that discussion? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? I don't know if I'm in the best microphone sitting, setting. Yeah, no, we hear you. Hear me? Yeah. Wow. I, I just was, it was sort of an offhand comment, but it triggered such a great discussion. Um, and, and clearly people feel really strongly about this. And, and my, my on this, I love the idea of this being um, in, you know, particularly attuned to specific time scales or degrees of physical contact and sort of what the environment is and what's transmissible in that environment. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to open the floor to people who contributed to that discussion if we want to really make it lively in the Zoom. Um, I, I just make one point, which is, I think there's a really interesting issue, which is the need for inner conversion between a physical cue and a chemical cue. And, um, and it's that point of, of contact between these different modalities that actually, I think is really interesting and really hard um, and um, has a lot of potential. Um, for either mixing up the message um, in a useful way or a deleterious way. So those are just some thoughts on that. But I'd love to hear from the few camps. There were so, I, I feel like there was Buzz's camp, which was very heavily chemical. So maybe I'm going to pass the mic to Buzz if he's here to, to speak about that. And then we should 
pass it off to maybe someone who wants to talk about the mechanical side. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so Buzz is emerging as sort of the lead hater on mechanics, uh, the argument being that there's not enough information content in mechanical uh, stimuli. Uh, this is me putting words in your mouth, Buzz, so please. <laughs> well, he wrote it in the text. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, that I think that, of course, phys uh, living systems are physical systems, so they have mechanics and they have to deal with it and they have to also, they can communicate, they can sense things. But for example, if you stretch a tissue, you know, every cell, some cells are feeling, what they feel is incredibly complicated and messy and where the signals are transmitted, we have no idea. How you turn that into a, an information content is actually very hard and our ears are very good at that. So we, we can, with hearing, we can understand tones. If you integrate over time, we can figure out things, but that's an incredibly sophisticated machine to do that. But chemistry, any receptor in your body can identify one specific chemical. And there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals in our body. So if you want specificity, if you want to know, you know, am I hungry? I think Florentine, and if you want to know, am I hungry, glucagon or insulin, I'll do different things. And it'd be very hard to do that mechanically. So of course, mechanics is hugely important. Development is a mechanical process as well as a chemical process. So it's fascinating, but there's something fundamentally different about the information content of a chemical cue and a mechanical cue. That was my perspective. But of course, they're both important together, and that's why. I think Jennifer wanted to weigh in on this point. Or you're muted. Yeah, um, my comment relates to this, but from the perspective of what we heard from Sebastian Stryken, uh, where he has really a beautiful system of tube morphogenesis, uh, where he can see shape changes, fate changes, um, uh, as well as potential, you know, myosin gradients, et cetera. And he can connect that to transcriptomics. Uh, so I'm curious as, I mean, to me, uh, you know, the question is, do you see particular uh, metabolic signatures that are associated with your different cell populations that are filling in these different niches that, you know, for instance, have the higher myosin contractility um, that might be driving some of these force changes. Um, so Sebastian. Yeah, I'm that's a very interesting question. And that's one of the things that we definitely want to do uh, in the future, right? So, I mean, we've now done, you know, single cell sequencing, so we can tell, you know, um, the fates, uh, we will be able to hopefully measure traction forces in those setups. And then ideally what we would like to have is kind of dynamic readouts for metabolic activity, right? So maybe even life sensors, right? Yeah. Uh, for mitochondrial activity and measure that, you know, in the course of the differentiation. Um, and then you could go and define certain well-defined sequences of steps that are occurring in this uh, uh, process and try to find correlations between, you know, metabolic activity and, you know, the differentiation process um, and maybe the force generation, how that gets fueled, you know, by the energies that, uh, that are being pro produced. And also, I would just say that this, this seems like a really ripe area for tool development um, to sort of get to combine, um, you know, the point that Buzz is making um, where, you know, his, his view is mechanics is very complicated, you know, how are you going to connect that with chemistry? if we can get tools that can give readouts for both of these um, changes, um, I think it could be really important in this field. Manu, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanted to pick a fight with Buzz. So uh, this is Great. a good moment. We're here to fight. Uh, yeah, I mean, fabulous uh, conversation, first of all. And I think, you know, I have a biased view about this, but. Frankly, uh, you know, the chemical signals and mechanical signals, we shouldn't be looking at them in such a binned approach anyway, because much of mechanics is then driven by much of these chemical motors. There is a very tight feedback at every length scale associated with this. And this, we should not find it hard to imagine this interconversion is happening at every length scale at an every time scale. The fundamental difference comes from how these signals propagate. You know, if you think about propagation and rate of propagation, diffusion ends up being very different. Uh, one thing can be connected to many things, while in mechanics, 
you have to have a readout or a chemical component that could be reading out on a very specific aspect of that signal, not just the fact that the signal is present. So there are just intrinsic things that happen to these signals over time. Uh, but overall, I mean, I think this framework is fundamental because molecules is what makes life and mechanics and physical instance is. And so this goes really early to a crawling cell or something even where much of the mechanics and chemistry is being integrated. I think I haven't seen many places where this integration. So I think, you know, that yeast example was a beautiful example in terms of thinking about this. But I, I mean, one thing that comes out of this sets of discussion, it would be really valuable to explicitly write this down uh, as a debate or not a debate, but just a thought because uh, uh, I think that integration is incredibly valuable. And we have lots of examples of this, so it can be very quantitative as well. Yeah, actually, this is sort I, actually, of an invitation for a future fight. But. Yeah, well, I, I, can I interject on this fight, which is, I, you know, I, there's all these examples where, 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 where mechanics is actually used to read out specificity of the chemical ligand. So T cell receptor, B cell receptor, integrins. Are there clear cut examples where we know for sure there's a cell cell interaction that's chemically mediated where there is not a mechanical component to that, to the readout? Because I feel like people are looking for it when they look for it and they don't, but you, otherwise you would not routinely look for it because why would you? So I think Buzz I wants say, to. Well, just to say that I think part of my, my maybe um, disagreement is that I think the word signaling is confusing because of course you can have mechanical interface where the mechanics is important, but that doesn't no, no, mean- but, but I mean, they actually use mechanics to determine if, if, if the chemical interaction is the correct ligand versus an incorrect ligand. But, but for example, notch delta is a very good example, which we've worked on. Where you need pulling, mechanical pulling to signal, but that doesn't mean that mechanics is 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 involved. It's like, I mean, it could be you could be that mechanics is key because it's a cell cell contact thing, but it could also be sometimes you need mechanics because the cells are you know physical objects, but it doesn't mean there's any information. You know, it doesn't mean there's there's actually information in the mechanical thing. And I think the problem with mechanical signaling is the word signaling. That mechanics is important, but but you know, for example, physics there's. Tony Hyman gave a talk in our place yesterday about you change temperature, condensates form, and you get different biochemistry. There's lots of physics. There's nothing to do with mechanics. It's super interesting and super important. Oh. But mechanics is only, you know, is a very a small part. And I think yeah, okay, biochemistry is everything. I mean, they're this, not everything. Yeah. They're, they're, biochemistry is what well, life is. Okay, so this allows me to clarify my question, which is: suppose you took something like this, where we know pulling is used to interrogate the receptor ligand interaction. You would argue that the pulling is just part of the interrogation machine not the actual signal. Suppose you were then to replace the ligand receptor interaction with simply just the coil coil, such that now you're transmitting force between the cells, but there's actually no biochemical interaction of the normal type. Would the cell still perceive that as a bound ligand? And in that case, isn't it true that it's the mechanics that's really carrying the signal? So let me add to this Wallace that every paracrine signaling which doesn't include direct cell-cell contact, we don't, won't have a mechanical component. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm thinking cell-cell, right, exactly. That's not true, Gasper. Well, there are mechanical we to, signals without yeah. uh, contact. So, so sure, in, but in the case of, of a paracrine, paracrine chemical uh, signaling, though. Chemical signaling, there's no, it's, there's no chemical. Although no, isn't no, it true it, that 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 if that that some odorant receptors, uh, if you replace the odorant with one made using deuterium, they no longer detect the the ligand properly. But that's about how the receptor interacts with the ligand, not you know that there's these yeah, vibrations. Yeah, that's that's okay. not, <laughs> but still, but I wonder, it, has, has anyone done this experiment of sort of engineering a mechanical linkage to replace the ligand receptor interaction and ask whether that still works? I mean. No. In, Sorry, I mean, I just want to comment on that because you're talking about mechanics at very different levels. For instance, if you say about signaling, chemical, biochemical signal can affect mechanics, not at the, maybe it's not perceived at the cellular, at, at the interaction point, but we know that we in that FGF, that all these signals actually affect cell mechanics as a downstream event and that actually that mechanics actually can affect back the signaling. So all this is being sorted out. And by the way, so, so let me talk, uh, let me team up with Manu here. Uh, hot buzz. <laughs> So, so two things. One, I agree with you with uh, with Bas that actually the biochemical one is more combinatorial. So you can have a ton of possibilities. Actually, that's true. 
but the propagation is very, it's diffusion limiting is very, or in some cases a bit different, but it's very limited. In terms of, but I'm gonna tell you one thing, it's gonna be very difficult to create biological structures if you don't have a sense of touch in the system. In other words, if the cells cannot perceive mechanics and, and detect the stress, because you need actually, it's like if you were trying to make a sculpture and you had your eyes closed and you have no sense of touch and how do you get feedback, information feedback on the geometry? It's very difficult to do that if you don't have mechanics. Yeah, but I don't think uh, so you need to that it's never important, just that it's not. No, no. Well, but I, I don't understand this argument of it's more important or not. First of all, because as I said, we have so many studies in biochemical signaling and so few on mechanics that I'm pretty sure that we don't know many of the things that are happening. But act, for instance, we have a paper that is going to come out soon, actually, where we actually show that actually it's the stresses actually that there are like stem cell differentiation in the formation of an organ. And you have an example right there. It's actually the stress localization of, I mean, obviously I cannot talk about it, but I mean, I could explain it actually. It's, uh, it's with a group of Jerome Gross in Paris actually, and we actually team up to study that in the limb. And, and we see that localization of stresses that drive actually the, the stem cell differentiation. So it does, it may have actually implications to mechanics to directly affect cell behavior directly. They, I'm talking about the endogenous mechanics. I'm not talking about externally applied mechanics. I'm talking the one that drives morphogenesis can it still change behavior to the point of differentiation. So I, I would be careful, I think. Jennifer? I have just a comment to Arthur. So um, you, I think you talked about um, that stress being a direct correlate of stem cell differentiation. Um, but it could also just be water release. Basically, you pull, I mean, this is work from uh, Dave White's group that, that I was involved in years ago. Um, basically, you put these cells down on a stiff substrate, uh, they pull out, there's stress. But what's really happening is that water channels, well, water moves out of the cell. And as a consequence, the cell itself, the cytoplasm becomes um, a stiffer environment. And that seems to be the critical trigger for the differentiation. I, I agree for that. For You mean so that you're talking different. about the bit? And that you're correlates talking about, with YAP, signaling, et cetera. So, I know, no, I agree. I agree. But that you're talking about the paper of Dennis Disher here, like the original paper that then Dave and, and you guys team up actually to understand this. I completely we agree. Have a, we have a very different perspective on what's driving the differentiation. It's not a physical force. It's basically a chemical change in terms of water release from the cytoplasm that triggers a uh, YAP uh, and other signaling pathways. Yeah, and I'm um, saying in that system, in, in cell culture, in that system, I completely agree. Actually, I'm just saying, I mean, yeah. in my talk, I, I mentioned the paper because there was a paper that triggered a lot of uh, right, uh, right. huge response in the field. But, but, I, I'm, but I, I think that if you look at many other studies actually that have been in the field, actually it's true that mechanics affect cell behavior. I mean, if you look at the 3D geometries with gels, actually people have studied that for tissue engineering. People have studied in 2D how it affects cell division, cell proliferation. So we, we kind of know that that affects. The question is whether those observations in vitro actually trans, I mean, are observed really in, in vivo, in the natural environment of cells. And I'm not sure actually about that. I'm, I'm well, really not this, sure. This I mean, gets back to this fundamental dichotomy. Um, you know, is it chemistry that's actually being triggered by that stress pathway, which I think is what Buzz is trying to. Um, oh, that I agree. Yeah. Hands down. I mean, like there's a mechanical signal is going to be transduced chemically inside the cell. That hands down. I mean, like, uh, okay. yeah, no okay. discussion about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what about, so, okay. So I feel like the contrast here is between chemistry, which everyone, I mean, so, so Celeste Nelson raised the question, why is there even a debate? What, what's, what's generating all these opposed? And I feel like part of it is that, you know, m most of us have come up through the molecular biology side of things where we're taught that every explanation has to be a certain kind of explanation we look for, which is what are the molecules, you know, what gene transduces what? And I think mechanics is, is sort of outside of that paradigm in some level, because it's this other sort of physical force. So I raised the question, what about other physical forces like electricity? I mean, no one would argue that a neuron's electricity is not carrying a lot of information. Um, what do we think about electricity carrying information? And this was raised by, I think that, that I'm not sure who, who raised the question actually in, anymore. There's so much chat, yes. but um, yeah, I think Vlad Perez, which, so um, the question is, yeah, electricity, other things like that. 
in you know non -neur non neuronal systems i suppose i mean there there are examples of like uh, electric gradients actually for instance driving migration and in vitro and, and now there is a paper yeah yeah and galvanotaxis and there's a paper and there's a paper recently in bioarchive by i don't remember his his name actually now i'm blanking by a young group in portugal uh that just actually show that in vivo it's happening in Senupus. Actually, you have these electrical gradients that you have galvanotaxis in vivo. So, I, and what I'm trying to say is that we are actually just skimming the surface of the physical cues. And, and this is why I'm careful in stating whether they're going to be useful or not. Maybe all is going to translate to biochemistry, actually, and like we're going to couple mechanics to biochemistry or electrical signals to biochemistry, and we can study all, all like that. But I would actually say that it's probably not possible because some of the physical propagation, as Manu was pointing out, the propagation of physical signals, either electric or mechanical, is different than the biochemical. So if you use that to transmit information, it's it's a different way. Yeah, so uh, that's what, what okay. I would say, like electric signals are just super fast, right? Um, so like much faster than any transport of molecules, um, if, even if you have strong flows, like, I mean, electric signals are much, much faster. And so, that might be a different time scale that we add, but I'm I'm also wondering, like you know, how much of you know is is a physiological regime of you know there might be lots of cells that might actually very be very unhappy if they have strong you know electric signals passing by. So, Buzz, were you trying to make a point? I saw you go like that with your hand. I guess I was just thinking that um, with electrical signals, if you want to use the information usefully. Because if, if it's going to spread, you know, through a system, there's a real problem in controlling the information flow. So if you want to use it usefully, you make a wired system, which is the brain, which is very complicated that can use electrical information to process the world, you know, in a fast way. And again, the problem with mechanics is that um, the mechanical thing is that if you're tissue changing shape, mechanical forces are happening all the time and cells are, are, you know, are being pushed and pulled and they have to decide what to ignore and what not to ignore and it's very hard for them. And there's a lot of stuff that's hard to control. So the ear, again, is a very specific system that's designed to measure mechanical cues in a very accurate way and get lots of information, but it's hard. So I think both electrical and mechanical, those kind of things are important, but they'll be important only in very specific, for, for doing specific things. And if it's about shape, then of course mechanics is key. And if it's about fast information flow in a neuronal network, electric is key. But in general, chemi chemistry is going to be important in all those systems because we're gene protein systems. Manu, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, related to what Celis said and now what Buzz said, um, it's not about what is important. We understand that in this physical world, these sets of you know, evolution and life evolves in a manner that it's going to use what it has accessible. What is important is for us to understand the design principles. If we are building and designing machines like this, how would we actually program and make sure that these sets of channels don't interfere with each other, they interfere exactly when we want to actually get robust output. So what I find exciting in this discussion is not what's important, but I mean, I understand what Buzz is describing as the sets of limitations. I can actually argue there are many, many examples of mechanics being the advantage over chemistry. You know, when you build and design computers, you don't wire everything with everything, which is a huge issue with chemistry in some sense. And so the design principles that come out of the substrate, and again, you know, if you go back to computational neuroscience and Mars level of understanding vision, he talks about the substrate, the algorithm, and the computation. With the sets of things that we are describing, the substrate is different, but it might be operating the same algorithm. And eventually that algorithm has a certain robust computation. But the principles that would come out of it are exactly why we're all working in these sets of spaces, because it will give us a much better intuition of how do you really utilize everything under the table, you know, computers and specific kind of nervous systems are great at one thing, but then they are very, very bad. Computers don't know what's happening around their environment. So they're terrible in becoming bodies and uh, animals because they are completely devoid of that mechanical regime. So it's, it's very interesting to the sets of goals that we are trying, our life is trying to solve, why it's necessary to operate in all of these domains simultaneously.
Well, I think that just about sums it up. So thank you uh, for everyone for a fantastic discussion this morning. Let's have a round of applause for, for everyone who took part in this epic uh, debate. And uh, I think at this point we have another break. Why don't we go ahead and get started with the, the last session for today. And um, for that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Zev Gartner. All right, thank you, Janine. Um, so uh, first, first up in this afternoon session, we have uh, Amy Gladfelter from UNC Chapel Hill. Amy, are you, are you ready to go? Looks like it. I am ready to go. All right, take it away. All right, can you see me? Hear me? Okay, that looks good. Great, thanks. So I'm really happy to be here to talk about my thoughts on the form and function of syncytial cells and how this relates potentially to the um, evolution of multicellularity. So I'm beginning here showing um, my favorite uh, multicellular structure, and I would argue that this is really um, one of the big developmental biology mysteries that still remains, which is the formation of fruiting bodies from fungi. You can um, appreciate here the magnificent forms, the magnificent colors, the varied shapes and sizes of these fruiting body structures. Um, but one of the other um, amazing features of mushrooms is the speed at which they develop, um, seemingly and often appearing just overnight. And what fascinates me is actually the underlying cells that feed this development, and that is the mycelial network. So mycelia of fungi um, play critical roles spatially organizing biochemical information in a lot of different contexts. We know that they serve as what's been called the internet of the forest, allowing long range chemical communication between trees. Um, they're essential for recycling of carbon um, and therefore are really integral to the terrestrial carbon sink. We know that they serve as scaffolds for spatially organizing the microbiome and um, enabling um, these different communities to have particular spatial structures. And of course, we also know that fungal mycelia can be pathogenic and are a source of opportunistic infections in plants and in animals. What's fascinated me for many years are um, the, the shapes of the cells that make up the fungal mycelia. And you can see an example of that here. Um, these are really extreme cells. They can achieve large sizes, very complex branched morphology. Um, and in many cases, they are multinucleated, like the cell that you can see here, where each of these um, dancing dots are individual nuclei that are cohabitating in a common cytoplasm. So syncytia like this or multinucleated cells are of course not unique to fungal mycelia. They are found throughout the tree of life. You can see um, representative multinucleate states um, really in all corners of the tree of life. And there's some speculation and discussion about whether syncytia could be a step on the path to multicellularity. We see um, lots of different examples of cells Somehow I've lost my ability to advance my slides. Hang on a second here. Um, we see lots of um, in, varied forms um, throughout um, the tree of life where you see a syncytial cell organization. So you can see this gives rise to many different morphologies um, where you have single cells with many nuclei in them. In many cases, though, these cells um, coexist with multicellular tissues and um, obviously play incredible importance in human health um, from the formation of muscle, bone, and blood to the syncytial trophoblast of um, placenta cells to syncytia that get formed by viruses and viral infection to syncytia that are formed um, in the process of tumorigenesis. So in all of these contexts, we have syncytia that coexist with multicellular tissues. So what sort of functional um, features do syncytia have that maybe make them distinct from uh, multicellular tissues? So if we think about the cytoplasm, there's multiple features of a syncytium that, that might give them um, sort of special uh, functionality. 
One is this interconnected cytosol, and this touches upon a, a theme that's come up numerous times, which enables coordination potentially across long time, long length scales, and may allow for integration of patchy, spatially patchy information or cues. Um, there's also um, potential barrier functions formed in a large cell like this that avoids cell-cell junctions. And this is certainly thought to be one of the um, functional implications for the syncytial trophoblast in placental cells. So this long range um, interconnected cytosol allows for um, really chemical communication, but also electrical communication, potentially over very large distances. Now, if we think about the hallmark of syncytia, the fact that they're multinucleated, this is another really important feature of them. And the idea here is that unlike a multicellular tissue, within a multinucleated syncytia, you can have mobile genetic elements. You can have nuclei that can essentially act as independent units and move throughout this network. So work um, in my lab and, and others has shown that nuclei within fungal syncytia like this display highly independent mobility. They have autonomous gene expression, even though they are sharing the same cytoplasm. We've seen that they can undergo the cell cycle asynchronously. They have potentially in certain fungi um, completely different genomes and certainly the potential for variable ploidy within, again, the same cell. And so it's a really interesting setting where you can have essentially genetic chimerism within a single cell. So why does syncytia form? Uh, you know, I, I can't answer that question. Maybe someday I'll be able to, but I like to think about it as a cell um, type that allows for the ability to respond to signals and sense signals and act locally, but yet still integrate these signals over large timescales and length scales and sort of think more globally. And that in this cell organization, what you've got is essentially sort of multicellular and unicellular lifestyles within one cell and potentially the ability to actually transition between these two different, very different ways of being. Um, within the exact same um, individual. So I'm going to just share a lot of the problems I find fascinating that we're working on and thinking about in, the, in these cells. So one is in the area of nuclear identity, and that is how does this chimeric state, whether it's different genotypes or different gene expression states, how does this foster either cooperation, competition, or division of labor, to use words that have come up again and again here in the multicellular context, how can we think about those playing out within a shared cytoplasm of resources, but with different genetic identities? Um, and what are the physical constraints on these different kinds of relationships and how they may get established? How persistent is a nuclear identity in these cells? And is this one function essentially of a syncytium is that this promotes actually more um, tolerance of genetic variation due to complementation between nuclei. Um, and so is this a space that essentially um, can allow for sort of more extreme variation? I think I had one more point. There we go. And then third is a question that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, which is how can these different nuclear identities um, be insulated in a common cytoplasm where these resources might be shared? And there's also cytoplasm coordination challenges. So to what degree is a syncytial cytosol a coordination device, to, to use a term I think Fred brought up yesterday, um, and serving as a connectivity tool, whether it's in these contexts of um, cells living on their own as a whole organism, or whether it's in the context of a multicellular structure. And ultimately, maybe more philosophically, who is an individual in these cells? And what is the unit of connected? Is it the unit of connected cytosol? Is it individual nuclei or clusters of nuclei that may be related? And, and what does this mean for the unit of selection in these contexts? And then finally, the last point I just want to make is that the syncytia that we see throughout the tree of life can form via very different mechanisms. And um, I, I think it's still very unclear the functional implications of these different origins of syncytia. So in my lab, we're studying fungal syncytia, which form through both nuclear division without cytokinesis, as well as cell fusion. We study placental cells that form through cell fusion and also um, mammalian cells that have been induced to fuse through um, virus infection. And so these bring up this issue, again, that's come up several times, the issue of um, 
uh, the origin of um, cells staying together versus um, cells choosing to come together um, and what that actually ultimately means when you form um, from a common origin versus when you have formed through fusion where you may actually um, have very many different identities um, uh, being the source of that cell. So just in my last minute here, I'll just talk about um, tools that we're using and that, that need further development for studying syncytia. Um, we're working to um, create engineered chimeras to try to force cooperation and competition to try to understand how that may play out as we make um, uh, uh, cells where individuals are lacking pieces of a, of a pathway and they have to cooperate in order to make something. We're um, trying to divide, design environments to spatially vary resources and constrain shape to understand um, so the length scale and the time scale at which signals are propagated um, and how um, the environment affects the pattern of these cells. And um, finally, our, our, what we're really putting a lot of effort into now is really trying to capture the degree of nuclear heterogeneity to understand using single nuclear sequencing and then multiplex imaging of genetic identity really um, uh, the, the sources and the spatial patterning of genetic heterogeneity um, are spatially, are, are different genotypes spatially clustered, do they distribute, um, and, and, and how does this relate to the resources that they're exposed to? So I'm just going to leave you with these questions of, of that, that, you know, we still don't have answers to, which is what functions make syncytia distinct from multicellular assemblies, and whether we can think about this as a relevant intermediary in the evolution of multicellularity, or if this is just simply another way to organize um, biology. So I'll just close with um, uh, some, some thoughts here that syncytial cells are absolutely essential to ecosystem and human health. We have a major developmental biology problem here in trying to understand how mushrooms are actually built that I think is highly relevant um, to uh, a, a lot of human health problems. Um, so I'll just thank everyone um, in my lab who um, is um, just phenomenal to work with, all my funding sources and my collaborators. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll take some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. Um, round of applause. And uh, maybe if I could, if I could start out with a with a quick question. I, I was I was really struck, obviously, with the the incredible dynamics of the nuclei in, the, in those videos, and I was wondering. Um, if you could comment a little bit on on what the rest of the cytosol was doing and the other organelles, is everything moving in a concerted way, or do you have bidirectional flow or stationary objects? Yeah, so um, you know all of the above, right? Um, and actually, you know, relating to um, Karen's Karen's talk earlier this morning, um, you know, these mycelial networks can vary dramatically in terms of the dimensions of the hyphae. So. Um, you know, that can definitely impact um, these fluid dynamics um, and the flow, the, the flow dynamics that we see. Um, you know, organelles, many of them are being actively transported. Um, some are moving bidirectionally, some are moving in a unidirectional way. Um, the mycelia are absolutely able to control the, sh the, the, the flow and the distribution of those contents, the organelles, the nuclear identity, actually different nuclei, will end up in different degrees of mix, mixing, will be um, have different degrees of mixing, depending on the shape, right? And so they, they can certainly be modulating fusion to change the topology of the mycelium, which is going to affect the distribution. So some things are fairly dependent on flow um, and are, they're gonna be remodeling the shape of the network in order to distribute throughout it. Um, but it's a mix, I would say. So I see Manu has, a, has his hand raised. Manu, you want to unmute? Uh, just a quick question, Amy, on fundamental limits of a syncytium. Uh, I mean, when we read these kind of reports about a fungus as large as the jungle and the forest, uh, how much should we buy into that? Is that truly a single syncytium? What do you think about as this thing keeps growing and you have distributed control with this nuclei, is there a fundamental limit to this architecture? I mean, beyond the most common, oh, mechanically it'll break apart, but if it's in a subterranean environment. Yeah, you know, I think this is a perfect example of something that's really not been well measured at all within um, a, a natural environment. Um, you know, we certainly can see in the lab 
um, this varies tremendously depending on the environment, right? And so as the cell becomes more stressed, it actually compartmentalizes more, right? So that the number of nuclei per compartment decreases in response to stress. Um, in, the, in the natural world, I think we do not know what the physical limit of that is. Um, there's also very different ways of being a syncytium in the, in the forest, let's say. Um, some are nuclei are highly clonal. Um, and in other cases, there's a tremendous amount of genetic variation where it's been sampled. Again, these are experiments that have not really been properly done in a natural context at all. <laughs> um, so I, I don't have a number on that. I wish I did. The Janilia field stations. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. <laughs> just like we learned that the ant colonies are much larger than we thought we might learn the fungus are much larger. Okay, I see a couple other really interesting questions here in the chat, uh, Amy, so maybe you can find time okay. to answer a few of those. Sure. Uh, and so um, we're up at about five minutes here, so why don't we move on uh, to our next speaker, uh, Celeste Nelson uh, from Princeton University. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great, there was a little bit of a challenge there. Okay, so this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed being a part of this workshop and enjoy, or I'm looking forward to um, uh, the discussion to follow. Um, today, what I thought I would do is, is uh, speak about something that I don't think has really been covered so far. Um, and that's um, about the challenges of being multicellular. Um, so we've, we've already talked about many of the advantages of multicellularity. Um, but being multicellular also brings with it several challenges, uh, most of which are related to scale. Um, so for example, as organisms get larger and larger, uh, the transport of gases, nutrients, and wastes um, to all of their constituent cells becomes, you know, starts to become a challenge. Uh, and in particular, beyond the length scale of um, you know, tens of cells or a few hundred micrometers, it becomes really difficult and challenging to rely on molecular transport alone in the form of, diff in the form of diffusion, um, since the, the time to diffuse is proportional to the square of the distance that needs to be covered. So while uh, most unicellular organisms, you know, perhaps with the exception of what Amy just discussed, um, can live at the scale of diffusion, uh, most multicellular organisms live in a very diffusion limited regime. And so multicellularity has had to evolve several solutions um, to these many challenges. Um, so we can think about these challenges and the solutions that uh, evolution has come up with by considering the evolutionary tree, uh, my depiction, uh, that I, I like the best is shown here with the birth of the earth at the center of the half circle and the extant species at the perimeter. I mean, we've already discussed parts of this tree with respect to uh, the generation of epithelial tissues, decision making in plants, the presence of, of macrophage, uh, fungi, um, and, and algae, for instance, um, and many other uh, parameters. But I want to use this tree to draw your attention to the fact that beyond the smallest of length scales, all multicellular organisms other than plants have had to evolve mechanisms um, to get oxygen to their tissues and cells. And these mechanisms are known as gas exchangers and are in the, the form of trachea and in insects, uh, gills and fish and lungs in, uh, in terrestrial vertebrates. And you know, the diversity of these organs is reflected in their underlying anatomy and physiology. So to appreciate this diversity, just think about the differences between how we oxygenate our cells as humans uh, compared to the mechanisms that are used by birds or, or even grasshoppers. So we as, as humans, as mammals, have lungs that are comprised of blinded and tubes, uh, which we ventilate by contracting a sheet of skeletal muscle known as the diaphragm to generate a pressure gradient and promote airflow. Gas exchange takes place at the terminal ends of this tree uh, where oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream. And in contrast, grasshoppers use bellows-like bellows -like structures known as air sacs uh, to move air. And birds uh, shown in, this, in the center of this gif use the same mechanism of air sacs just at a much larger length scale. And they, uh, birds, have the added advantage of promoting airflow in a single direction so that they never mix uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated air. 
So even if we focus exclusively on the vertebrate branch of the evolutionary tree, we see enormous diversity in gas exchangers from the alveoli in mammals to parabronchial lungs in birds to uh, which promote this unidirectional airflow um, to the fabular surface and the lungs of, of reptiles. And we've been curious about the origins of this um, and engineering applications of this bi biodiversity and have taken the approach of investigating the developmental mechanisms that give rise to the lungs of, of mice, chicks, and lizards. And as you might guess, there are dozens of labs around the world focused on identifying the signaling pathways that are essential for building uh, the lungs in particular um, of mice uh, given its use as a model for, for the human lung. And dozens of molecules have been identified, but these same pathways are used in the development of lungs in all three classes of vertebrates. Uh, so knowing this parts list uh, can't, can't answer our question. So uh, since as engineers, we're most interested in understanding how to build uh, these tissues physically, we've taken an orthogonal approach and focused on the physics of the process. And so if we think of an epithelium that's going to give rise to um, a gas exchange surface in a lung as a simple material, either a flat sheet or a hollow tube, then that material will have uh, mechanical material properties that'll be either elastic or viscoelastic and will respond to forces, either internal or external, to fold itself over developmental time into the more complex structures that we see uh, at these gas exchange surfaces. So in the mouse, uh, the lung begins as a simple tube, the trachea, that splits into uh, two primary bronchi that then recursively branch to build the 8 million tubes that are present in the adult organ. And at the same time as that epithelium is forming into those um, 8 million branches, the surrounding mesenchyme is differentiating uh, into airway smooth muscle, which wraps circumferentially around uh, the epithelium. Several years ago now, uh, using transgenic mice that express uh, red fluorescent protein uh, downstream in the alpha smooth muscle actin gene promoter, we found that airway smooth muscle um, first appears at the basal surface of the epithelium at the future branching site before the epithelium changes shape and then wraps around um, that nascent branch. And we found that this pattern of smooth muscle differentiation serves as a mechanical constraint akin to a girdle uh, to shape the epithelium into branches. So by combining some um, uh, pseudotime analysis of smooth muscle differentiation from single cell RNA sequencing data with um, time-lapse a reporter time-lapse analysis of reporter animals coupled with um, in vivo tension sensors, we found that it's actually the immature um, smooth muscle cells right after the initiation of differentiation that are most essential for folding the epithelium. At this stage, the cells have started to stiffen relative to the surrounding undifferentiated mesenchyme and thus provide the patterning for that girdle, um, despite the fact that they don't express all of the smooth muscle transcriptome. But that conclusion I just showed you um, came from painstaking experiments collected over the past many years, essentially several sequential and parallel PhD uh, student thesis projects. And this theme of, of function being uh, conveyed by a cell prior to its complete differentiation is one that keeps popping up um, at conferences that I attend. And so one blue sky vision uh, for, for the field um, which you know, sort of relates to this, the, the discussion that we had uh, after the previous session is that we, we really need a way to easily uncover the mechanical properties of cells within multicellular tissues, both over space and over time as they change their fate, sort of an omics revolution for mechanics, if you will. And this revolution, I would posit, maybe a lot would allow us to correlate gene expression over time with changes in mechanical properties, or even completely redefine what we mean by a cell type based on its biophysics rather than, than its transcriptome. So in the remaining few minutes, I wanna briefly cover how lungs develop in other uh, classes of vertebrates, birds and reptiles. Um, our model bird is the embryonic chicken, and although their lungs eventually form into a rigid unidirectional circuit, at the earliest stages of their development, they look very similar to the mammal and begin as an epithelial tube, uh, shown here in orange, that elaborates into a tree via branching morphogenesis. In this case, however, we found that the epithelium itself drives its own folding via apical constriction so that the actively contracting cells generate new branches. And this apical constriction process is conserved across domesticated birds. 
And importantly, at this stage of development, there's no smooth muscle present within the developing bird lung. So then how does that branched tree with terminal ends remodel itself to uh, form the unidirectional airflow of the parabronchial lung? Well, um, over a hundred years ago now, uh, Losi and Larcel reported that the terminal ends of the tree at, the, at late stages of chick lung development migrate over distances of millimeters, hundreds of them over distances of millimeters and eventually fuse or anastomose with each other uh, to complete the circuit for airflow. And we recently started to investigate the dynamics of this process um, with a focus on the underlying biophysics. And lo and behold, what we found is that the epithelium that fuses does so between gaps in smooth muscle coverage. So here um, in the bird, the, fuse, the smooth muscle appears and wraps around branches after the tree is already formed and then serves as a barrier. And hence um, its absence, the places where it's absent uh, facilitate the extension, collision and fusion of those epithelial tubes. So smooth muscle does play a physical role in the development of the bird lung, just at a very different stage in, in its morphogenesis. Right now, finally, mammals and birds have these really complex lungs uh, that uh, promote gas exchange and have enabled lifestyles and niches that require really high metabolic demand. And in contrast, the lungs of reptiles are fairly simple. Many lizards, for instance, have lungs that are essentially empty bags with a bumpy epithelial surface of fabioli that serve to promote gas exchange. So we've been investigating the development of the lizard lung using the brown anole as a model organism. And what we found is yet a third mechanism of, of development distinct from the bird and the mammal. Here is shown in the middle graphic, the lung begins as a simple epithelium in green, which then is covered really rapidly, uniformly over its basal surface by a sheet of smooth muscle that then migrates um, over the period of about 24 hours to form into a hexagonal mesh. Uh, through which the epithelium protrudes to form that fabiolar surface in response to fluid pressure within the lumen of the organ. We call this process stress ball morphogenesis because of its resemblance to the toy uh, that you might have on, on your desk. So three different classes of vertebrates, three different physical mechanisms to build their gas exchangers, all of which rely eventually on the differentiation and patterning of smooth muscle. And so uh, we think some of the differences um, between these uh, classes come from how quickly smooth muscle differentiates and when it begins to differentiate in the lungs of each species. Uh, here I show the timelines of gestation or incubation uh, for mouse, chicken, and brown anole, onto which is mapped the initiation of lung development in blue and then the duration of smooth muscle differentiation that we've uncovered. And you can see they're very, very different. So the second blue sky vision for the field um, is we need a way to easily predict the dynamics of development, whether it's the onset or the rate of differentiation or the location. And this might help us to understand whether timing um, of multicellularity um, is encoded by the genome or whether it's coordinated and really um, something that's an epigenetic phenomenon. Um, so with that, um, thank you so much for uh, putting together what's been a fantastic workshop, and I would be happy to chat. Wonderful round of applause, uh, Celeste. You got a, a number of, oh my God, uh, spectaculars as you, as you started to show the lizard lung. Um, so maybe we uh, open things up to questions. I see Manu has his hand up, his physical, actual hand up. Yeah, sorry, just a quick question, Celis. Um, on the lizard side, going all the way to crocodiles, uh, I mean, just in terms of the total surface area, is that architecture scalable for larger and larger body plants? And where would some of the largest uh, reptiles like this fall in? Yeah, I've been thinking about this issue of scale a lot over the last 24 hours based on the discussions yesterday. Um, so the, the simplest uh, reptile lungs really appear to be in, in the smaller, um, in the smaller uh, reptiles. Um, as a class of, of organisms, reptile lungs are probably like the most diverse. Um, so, so I showed you the simplest um, uh, crocodiles and alligators have lungs that in the adult are just amazing. So they have regions of airflow, 
Um, so this is work from Colleen Farmer in, at Utah. They have regions of airflow that look uh, tidal, like, like our lungs, and other regions of airflow that look unidirectional. Uh, so I actually had an NSF grant that was intended to, to fund us to work on <laughs> crocodile uh, lung development. We, we had trouble getting, um, getting organisms, as you might imagine. Um, it's not clear um, you know, how, uh, how high the, in terms of length scale, the simple lung can scale, but it does seem that complexity increases as you get a larger um, organism. What's fascinating to me thinking about scaling is, is you know, how inefficient our lungs as mammals are in terms of a gas exchanger. I mean, we mix fresh air and stale air, and, and so that means we can't do things like fly over the Himalayas like birds can. But, but that lung itself, that structure itself, scales over dramatic ranges. I mean, you think about the tiniest mammal has the, basically the same structure of lung as the blue whale. Right, so that boggles my mind. You know, we can't do amazing feats like fly like hummingbirds, or as I said, fly over the Himalayas. But um, that structure is still is still um, you know efficient enough uh, that ma that mammals can populate uh, a wide diversity of niches. We might have time for one more very quick question from Ache. Hi, so that's an amazing talk. Actually, I love the comparative side. Actually, um, so. To what extent, actually, so I'm very surprised actually to see that you seem to see the same mechanism of a smooth, the same role of a smooth muscle in many different organisms uh, in the branching, even if playing different, slightly different mechanisms. But this, so there are two questions about that. Um, well, let me actually just ask one because we don't have time. So to what extent, how do different tissues coordinate? Have you, have you looked carefully into the coordination of like the, the, the morphogenesis of the two tissues to drive that structure, to the, the formation of that structure? Um, yeah, this is a long answer. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be able to answer your question precisely. What I, what I can say is that in, in, the, in the mammal, the, the differentiation of smooth muscles seems to be very precisely controlled. Um, in the reptile, at least in the lizard that we've been looking at, what we see is massive differentiation over the entire surface. And then the patterning is generated by migration of the cells. And one cool thing, uh, one cool feature that you might have been, been able to appreciate from the, the video of the, of the reptile lung is that the smooth muscle layer in that case is very loosely covering over the epithelium. So if there is crosstalk between that epithelial layer and the smooth muscle itself, there's a physical disconnect um, that, uh, that has to be accounted for in the crosstalk. So I, I think, you know, in the interests of time and, 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 uh, and, and moving on, I can try to answer your question more, more uh, uh, in depth in, in, in the chat, perhaps. We'll talk later, thanks. All right, thanks again, uh, Celeste. And I see a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, so uh, next, let's move to uh, Andrew Murray. Uh, who is joining us from Harvard University. Okay, so I am the king of the reductionists. And so I'm going to give you a reductionist talk. And why does reductionism matter? That's how most science has advanced here to heroes of the French left. Here's the famous statement, to see que vrai pour le colibacile et vrai pour l'éléphant. What's true for E. coli is true for the elephant. You can have a long argument with someone who works on transcription of whether that's really true or not. You cannot possibly have an argument about whether that statement helped people figure out eukaryotic transcription by telling them which experiments to do to figure it out. Okay. So who's multicellular? They're undifferentiated collections. They're evolutionarily related collections of cells with specialization of labor. There's Johnny Depp. There are three critical aspects of multicellularity. You've got multiple cells. You've got single cell propagules, at least for many multicellular organisms. And there's division of labor. So the evolutionary questions are, who did multicellularity evolve from? So here's my tree of life. There is an ancestral unicellular purple cell. It comes to a fork in the road. Down one side of the fork, the cells are almost genetically identical, but some are multicellular and some are not. We wait 500 million years or so. And then we look at their 
evolved descendants whose colors have changed because their genotypes and phenotypes have changed too. So if we wanna figure out what happened at that branch, we get to ask two questions. Is the tree right? So that's actually sort of still contentious in various places in evolution. And how good are we at inferring ancestral genotype and phenotype? And if you think you're really good at it, let me know, okay? So the, that's the question of who did multicellularity evolve from? What was that purple ancestor? What happened? Then there's a sort of, you know, cell biological question that people have talked about. How did multicellularity evolve? Same tree, same question. Okay. Here's a slightly different tree. So now multicellularity has evolved. There's a split. One branch, it stays without division of labor. And the other one, it has it. So there, and again, I'm pointing out that there's been many hundred millions of years of evolution in between times. So we have to infer backwards, right? This is what we're missing. Okay. If you watch Doctor Who, that's the TARDIS through which Doctor Who travels in time. We are unable to do this. So one approach is to resort to engineering to test hypotheses about the evolution of life by reconstruction. It partially defines a space of possibilities. It lays the groundwork for experimental evolution, which typically ideally has minimal preconception. It partially defines a space of possibilities. And what one can investigate is limited by human ingenuity and the tendency of organisms to cheat and do something different than you expected to answer the selection. So there's no multicellularity, which is here. There's lineage specific. In lineage specific multicellularity, cells stick next to their clonal relatives. I believe that eliminates all this uh, talk about levels of selection because ultimately, Every clonal organism, however many cells it has, originates from a single cell. Then there's aggregation of different genotypes. That doesn't eliminate questions about levels of selection. Okay, <clears throat> So you can ask, why are things multicellular? <clears throat> and Will Ratcliffe, who works on similar problems to us and in quite complementary ways, in a sense, his selection for snowflakes, which is a gravitational settling one, is a version of don't be lunch. It's a selection for size per se, in his case, is reflected by settling speed. So here are some organisms that are unicellular and some very small fish that can eat them. You get big enough, the fish die instead of you. Okay. Here's another argument for why you could be multicellular. Imagine there is some complex nutrient, polymeric black balls, there is a black ball hydrolase in the wall of a cell. It releases simple nutrients, individual balls. These are imported by cells and taken up. The physics of diffusion means that most of the monomeric molecules escape into space and are never seen again, more than 99%. So you harvest a small amount of what you produce. If you stick to your neighbors, you harvest a small amount of what you produce and a small amount of what each of your neighbors produce. And so this could be one driving force for multicellularity. Like Will, we study yeast because it grows fast. You can make it do sex, has excellent genetics. And to a reductionist, it can be made to be multicellular by preventing the dissolution of the cell wall that holds a mother and daughter together even after the cytoplasms are separate. So this is John Koshranes, who came from an engineering background. And this is the slide you just saw, but now the complex nutrient where there are two balls is sucrose, the enzyme that hydrolyzes, hydrolyzes it, invertases in the cell wall, and the single black ball are glucose and fructose. So John made a prediction from free parameter, free simulations. That means all the parameters are experimentally measured that in low sucrose concentration, single cells cannot proliferate and form colonies, but clumps of cells can. You can engineer that clumpiness into a lab strain. You can deposit either clumps or single cells in the wells of a microtiter dish. 
the clumps grow in sucrose, the single cells don't. You need to do a control where you supply them with glucose and fructose, where, which are not public goods. And now the single cells grow. So like Will, John wanted to know what evolution would do. So you allow cells to proliferate. You imagine that multicellular mutants might arise. They might have a selective advantage and they might take over. And these are just four different slides of four parallel experiments that John did that show that you can evolve multicellularity. But when you do, it looks quite different in these different cases. So the last thing I'll talk about briefly is dividing and conquering. Actually, let me just go back for one second. In these big clumps, and Will mentioned this, the inside in the environment is going to be different just because the cells are hydrolyzing nutrients and producing waste. That can give rise to an initial form of differentiation, which is just driven by environmental differences. And then there's an interesting question of when such differentiation becomes dependent instead on cellularly produced signaling molecules rather than metabolites. This is Mary Wall. She was interested in the division of labor. Um, in mixed society, you can have cheats. If you have clonal growth, even if cheats arise within clones, the, clone, the cheats end up in their own clones. And therefore, if the advantage of sticking together is local rather than global, the cheats will lose. So what Mary did was to engineer divided labor. So she wanted irreversible differentiation, limited somatic cell proliferation, <laughs> And she wanted the somatic cells to help the germ cells. So this is just a diagram. The germ cells grow faster. They occasionally give rise to somatic cells that grow slower and produce molecules that benefit germ cells. And she wanted to use that to test the following hypothesis. That multicellularity is an advantage to division of labor when cheats exist. So they're germ cells, somatic cells, and cheats. Someone's dropping silverware in the background. Okay. And so here for the unicellular version, the somatic cells and the germ cells are not together. The cheats arise. They harvest the benefit from the somatic cells, but they grow faster than the germ cells because they're not making germ cells. And they take over and you have the tragedy of the commons. If you have cheats and it grows faster when it's close to the somatic cells in these multicellular colonies, eventually all the cheats are in their own colony. And if the benefits are local, the cheats will be kept under control. And because time is short, I'm not showing you results, but at the bottom, there's the reference to the paper that Mary produced that shows that at least in an engineering sense, this works. So my argument is, Diversity of approaches is important, but we need some concentrated effort on very simple questions if we really want to make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, you know, I, I wonder, maybe just to start things off with a q and think you made a strong argument for this reduction of, reductionist approach to, to multicellularity, but what would your own critique be of this of this approach well it, it, it's the i mean i'll offer two critiques there's a critique of doing engineering and evolution that's experimentally informed rigorous speculation in the laboratory it doesn't actually tell you how evolution worked not for one second and then the critique of the reductionist approach is always that you could have it wrong you could believe that you're inducing general principles and you could be looking at some horribly specific system and it's certainly not an, it's an argument, you know, that's why it was good to have both Lambda and the LAC operon because certain principles appear to be true in both. And therefore, you know, there's a small level of majority voting. So I'm not arguing that everyone should work on one problem. I'm just arguing that at some level picking, the goal it seems to me is to pick the simplest form of a problem that you believe well illustrates the general features that many examples of the problem have. And that's an interesting challenge and you can get it wrong. Absolutely. So maybe just briefly continuing along that line of reasoning, 
what might be the orthogonal system that you would put together um, where you can begin to deduce some of those common principles? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I, I always found the Volvox Chlamydomonas Pandorina thing really fascinating. The trouble is that although they clearly evolved from a common ancestor, it was quite a long time ago, but and it turned out that Volvox actually has very beautiful genetics. And there was a guy who worked on it and he eventually retired. All the strains got lost. And its main problem is it has an incredibly long time in the sexual cycle for the cyst to germinate. A, a geneticist could select for mutations that remove that. But it's been a sort of graveyard of various postdocs. So that's clearly not the right system. So I, I honestly don't know. Hmm. All right, I see uh, Manu has his, has his virtual hand raised. Uh, so Andy, just a quick follow up on, uh, I think this argument about uh, why multicellular was an important one and in the reductionist approach, one of the comments you made about is the feeding and then it's not because, can you expand on that? I mean, I find that it's one of many plausible options Oh, absolutely. I wasn't dismissing that hypothesis. I, I mean, the interesting thing is that it's evolved many times. It's likely that the driving selective force has probably been different in different situations. I suspect it's been combined in, in lots of situations. Sorry, I didn't mean in the least to eliminate any of the possibilities. I, I think there are multiple possibilities and their relative importance was likely to be different. And my guess is we haven't managed to yet elucidate all the reasonable possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, on that framework, again, uh, the design of the experiments, I can imagine suddenly take a very strong, sharp turn. And uh, I mean, I guess, in the going back to this historical perspective, uh, there was a roadmap that was laid out, and so I guess are you suggesting in that that I mean again goes back to uh, what Inyaki had said yesterday. Uh, what would be valuable out of this discussion would be a reductionist roadmap. I would love to sort of see more options, even without the framework of possible systems, because you know creativity and people poking around is what gives rise to these possible new systems. So anyway, I just, I think it would be phenomenal to see a little more uh, on that roadmap at some point. Yeah, and I, I think I'm being maximally provocative. I think it is useful to study extant organisms and to try and infer backwards. I'm just, I was just trying to illustrate how ridiculously hard it is and how frustrating that makes it. I wasn't arguing it shouldn't be done. You have about 30 seconds, maybe, for a question from Gasper. Uh, thank Andrew, the, my question is whether the outcome of this experiment with the cheaters and mixing germline and soma uh, depends on the ratios of the different cells in the different kind of clumps, the initial, initial ratios. So in the, in the experiment we did, there were clumps that were all cheaters and there were clumps that were all cooperators because ultimately every time a cheat arises, it will eventually in a short order of time be in clumps that only have cheaters. We didn't make mixed clumps, right? Because then it gets complicated. But because the, the mutation to cheating is gonna be very rare, most of the descendants of the cheats are gonna be in clumps that are all cheats, not in mixed clumps. Or that's our excuse for not doing that experiment. It's also the way we set it up, it would have been hard to do that. All right, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for the thought provoking presentation. And uh, I think Gasper, perfect, perfect segue to our next speaker. Okay. Um, so I will uh, speak about chemistry. And uh, I will start by uh, the speculation of uh, 
this chemical brain hypothesis, how, uh, how when you have a multicellularity and division of labor, that there's a need for cells to communicate and that initially there was no nervous system. So this communication must have been a chemical. And the, the idea I would like to propose here that actually by chemical wiring, so that you have specific signal molecules and specific receptors expressed in subsets of cells. And if you multiply these chemical signals, you can actually wire arbitrarily complex uh, networks of cells, just like with the synaptic wiring. So there's no limit. Uh, the limit is only in the, in the how many chemicals and receptors can you evolve. And you can, just like in a synaptic connected nervous system, you can have all kinds of uh, combinatorial codes and signals. So like two ligands uh, acting on uh, the same cell which expresses receptors for the two you can have synergies antagonistic uh, relationships you can have cascades of signals so cells talking to each other in in this relay like uh, manner and uh, you can imagine this as a chemical connector so which cell talks to which cell through which uh, signaling um, molecule and uh, <clears throat> Just to uh, comment on, on Amy's uh, comment in the chat. So what, what about the constraints of chemistry and physics? And uh, in this uh, paper, I argue that actually peptides are the best uh, signals to evolve uh, uh, diverse chemical uh, communications because they are highly diffusible, a lot more than proteins and highly diverse, so not like ions or nitric oxide, which are quite boring. You can have almost unlimited diversity of peptides because these are fragments of proteins. And if you have uh, um, lengths of like 10 amino acids, then the uh, possibilities are astronomical. And you can also have very specific receptors for all of these peptides. But then, of course, there's the problem of the diffusion limitation, as, as we have heard from the talk of Celeste. And I think um, maybe one drive to evolve uh, projections and evolve nervous-like structures is actually to overcome this diffusion barrier. Because if you imagine that the cell starts to grow branched projections, just like the, the lungs or the circulatory system, then you, you can reach to a larger uh, distance just by extending the surface of release. And then the other invention would be the uh, advent of circulatory systems, which actually overcomes the diffusion barrier. And we can still have hormones in, in a blue veil or in our bodies that actually uh, diffuse from our uh, hypothalamus to uh, uh, all over our bodies through the circulatory system. Now, <clears throat> this uh, idea li um, links to the, this environmental signal transducer hypothesis, which I think is one um, way of thinking about how neuropeptides and nervous signaling evolved, namely that peptides were the ancestral mediators of whole body coordination because they could diffuse around, around the multicellular body and influence all the target cells that have the right receptors by just paracrine signaling. And uh, we have uh, many cases where this uh, release is uh, actually influenced by environmental signals. And then the different peptides can include different cues of the environment. So I show a few examples. One is, is these uh, peptidergic cells in the gonad of, of a jellyfish. And uh, this is the jellyfish clitia, which is these gonads. And the uh, gonad um, ectoderm has these cells which express a peptide and they also express an opsin, so light sensitive molecule. And what the system regulates is actually the release of the gonads. So when in the morning the, the light um, intensity increases, then uh, this through this opsin triggers the release of this peptide. And this peptide then goes to the peptide receptor, which is in the oocyte and triggers the maturation of the oocyte and the release of the gamete. And so this is a very direct environmental mediation through a peptidergic signal. And um, if you mess with this pathway, knock out the, the opsin or the receptor, then you don't get the release of the, of the oocytes and you get these swollen gonads. The other example is trichoplax, which is actually uh, an animal without neurons, uh, yet it's an animal which has neuronal signaling molecules. So it's full of uh, these peptides, which are used in, in, in the brain of, um, for example, bilaterians, the neuropeptide molecules. And these are 
expressed in very specific sets of cells. Many of them are really highly cell type specific. Uh, uh, up to now, we have found 31 different uh, precursor proteins that are cleaved to produce more than 100 different peptides. And this is an organism without a nervous system. And these uh, peptides actually drive and coordinate the behavior of these animals. So these are considered like amorphous blob-like animals, just two tissue layers uh, that crawl with cilia and have these very fast epithelial contractions. If we add this peptide just to the medium, they become like these rotating uh, dishes uh, of completely crazy um, morphology, completely circular and, and spinning like a, like a spinning uh, disc. So this is what the peptide can trigger. And we think that also in this organism, when these peptides are released by the cells from maybe by some type of stimulation, they can reprogram the behavior of the entire multicellular ensemble. The third example comes from uh, this marine uh, worm, the platinaris, it's an annelid. We studied the larvae of this organism. And this is also full of peptides, just like every other animal. For example, they are these beautiful neurosecretory sensory cells. And these have a neuropeptide, which is called myoinhibitory peptides. It's very specifically expressed in these cells. And what these cells do, they sense uh, so-called settlement cues. Uh, which are chemicals produced by biofilms. And uh, this marks the settlement site for these larvae. They are planktonic and they have to settle on the ocean floor. And if you add this peptide, you can trigger this settlement behavior. So basically the larvae stop, stop swimming and crawl on the surface and start to explore the surface, which is very similar to what they do when you add the biofilm. And in fact, if we add the biofilm, then we can induce settlement, but if we knock out this peptide, then we don't get settlement. So it's again an environmental sensing mediated by a peptide that completely reprograms behavior and actually triggers a life cycle transition, which is a settlement and metamorphosis. Now, the problem is that uh, these are nice examples, but every nervous system has over 100 of these peptides. So, and these are all very cell types specifically expressed. These are examples from the platinaris nervous system. All different panels show different uh, neuropeptide cellular level expression of these. And uh, the way you have to imagine these, that of course, we always think about the nervous system as the connectome. And of course, Chanelia, this is a, is a very prominent approach. And of course, we have also done the connectome because uh, the synapses are super important. So you, you can section and, and image by electron microscopy whole nervous systems and animals, and then you get the connectome. And this is just the synapses. Every node is a cell, and then every connection is a synaptic connection. And you can subdivide the modules, the circuits, and analyze them. Um, the problem uh, with this that all this synaptic connectome is soaked in these hundreds of, of chemicals, and many of these come from the central neurosecretory area of the brain. So you can imagine like a, an Intel chip soaked in the sigma sigma catalog. So many of these peptides are expressed in these sensory cells, probably mediating all kinds of uh, slowly changing environmental variables, like UV light chemicals, temperature, hypoxia, pressure, and so on. And uh, when uh, any of these is triggered, then the whole nervous system is, is reprogrammed. And we know that every uh, synaptic circuit and every neuron is modulated by these peptide and also monoamine modulators. So we can, of course, map these. We, can, we are very good in mapping now in biology. We can sequence, we can do spatial in situ. We can do immunogold labeling as we did here. This is an EM section and the black dots are immunogold label of one of these peptides. You can do it across section. This is one section with leukokinin, next section with RGWMI. You can go through hundreds of sections and then you can map in all these uh, different peptides and do it for the whole body. So we can map these into to the different cells. And we can also map the receptors. This is, for example, single cell data, uh, ligand and receptor. And you can build up this chemical connectome. Now it's real data, it's not, not anymore theoretical. And you have all these different uh, networks of chemical connectivity, essentially. So uh, hundreds different layers 
that are overlaid on the synaptic connectome. So this is the real challenge to disentangle these various multimodal connectivity and how these things interact in the multicellular organism. And I think what we would need is to analyze these in real time. We can look at neuronal activity in real time. And, um, but we, it's very hard to look at signaling by these chemicals. Uh, there are some not very good uh, receptor uh, sensors. I think there's a, a, there's a huge room for improvement here to really visualize what's going on uh, these hidden layers of the nervous system. For example, G protein sensors would be very good because there are not so many than the receptors and they could be broadly applicable for, for many types of problems. Thank you. Very thought provoking, Jasper. Um, I saw a number of questions in the chat, but they're getting lost in a very complex back and forth. So um, uh, I, see, I see Manu has his virtual hand up. Jasper, very quickly, uh, very quickly, since you uh, showed data on Tplex. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the, this is a great example of mechanics and chemistry working together, but that's for another day. Maybe could you comment on uh, the notion of combinatorics and starting to think about a language associated with, because the number of combinations just becomes astronomical and we can actually do these experiments and we're finding certain sets of combinations actually do not have meaningful outputs. So just very broadly, when you think about uh, evolution of neuropeptides, could you talk a little bit very much in the context of quorum sensing? Uh, what do you think uh, are meaningful languages? Where are the words if the neuropeptides are the alphabets? Yeah, I think one constraint is where are the receptors? So for combinatory signal, you have to have the receptor for the two or more signals in the same cell. So I think by looking at that, by sequencing or ma mapping these, we can actually constrain down which peptides could talk to, uh, together and then yeah. try to experimentally yeah. test. But in my intuition, what I understood was why do they need to be in the same cell if they can evoke independent, the organism integrates behavior. And this is what we find, for example, ciliary behavior in different parts of the organism still gets integrated. So co-localization should not be necessary, or is it? Well, I don't, I don't know, but the fact is that uh, there are many cells, well, not that much in trichoplugs, but in platinaries, we have cells which have 20 peptides co-localized. So if you imagine those, uh, those are released at the same time. This is a chemical nightmare to, to, to figure that out what's going on because it's 10 connectomes set in motion at the same time. Jennifer? Uh, yes, Gaspar, that was really exciting. Um, two questions. One relates to how, you, how important do you think this neuropeptide signaling is in higher organisms with a big nervous, you know, with real nervous systems and synapses. And secondly, um, assuming it is important, um, in your system, do you have any evidence that the neuropeptides that are released um, are being released to specific cell types? And could they be self-inhibitory? I mean, could they be released to you know, from one neuron to another neuron and, you know, uh, sort of self inhibit the whole system or, you know, change the whole um, local activity of those neurons based on the peptide that's being secreted. Yeah, so, so first, first of all, they are very important. Every nervous system, even the mammalian cortex is full of them. And if you map them, these are actually the most highly specific and highly expressed markers. It's amazing mm -hmm. that it just it came to light from recent single cell sequencing. These are the best identifiers of, of neurons, even in the mammalian cortex. And uh, whether there is auto inhibition or feedback, um, or possibly yes. And uh, there are maybe some cases where, uh, where you could find this out by looking which cell is co-expressing the, the peptide and its receptor, and that would be kind of a feedback uh, loop. But we find like cascades, and I um, think it's, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, that's really great. Thank you. Come. 
Okay, well, I, I think we are set for a, a break right now. Uh, great. Um, so uh, next up, we have uh, Buzz Baum from MRC. And uh, Buzz, you ready? Yeah, so um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed the discussion. So hopefully, maybe we can trigger another one. So my talk today is going to be very general, but I was going to sort of ask the question about what is a cell or a, what's the right unit um, to think about when we think about organisms. So of course, there are lots of different levels of organization. Uh, on Earth, um, and which um, you know, and, and there's you know atoms that are. In fact, you can even think about selection because, of course, the atoms that are present today have gone through a process of synthesis, and some of them are unstable. And so there's selection at all these different levels, even at atoms and planetary scale. But of course, the key thing that we're talking about today is how cells become tissues. But I'd like to argue in my talk that really, um, and this is something Karina mentioned uh, yesterday, was that the cell is really the amazing thing that the the uh, the cell is the is is the sort of is the incredible thing, um, and of course the reason the cell is so special is because the cell is the thing where it's the it's the unit of organization the level of organization where life really emerges. So before the cell, you can have you know membranes that can grow and divide. You can have self sustaining chemical networks where you add other chemicals and they'll make in, into these self sustaining loops so you make more of a b c d e and you can also have self-replicating molecules but it's when they came together in a cell that uh, as darwin surmised they gave rise to everything on in life on earth and i like to think that this picture of his number one is not one but it's a cell with two chromosomes and a spindle because it's a cell dividing and so this is a uh, more like a modern picture of what the history of life on earth looks like and of course there was this coming together event at the birth of the first cell where you had all these things that had to happen, replicating molecules, metabolism, lipids coming together to form the first cell. Um, uh, and then you've got bacteria and archaea. And of course, um, later on in the history of life, and several billion years later, you've got this second coming together event, which is something that Darwin missed. Life isn't just about selection and mutation, and uh, it's also about coming together. And this coming together of two cells, um, one can imagine it being um, quite a simple thing so that all eukaryotes, the first eukaryote was this simple bag uh, with two cells coming together, a bacterial partner and an archaeal partner. But in fact, all eukaryotes, as we know, are incredibly complicated. Um, and it's more likely that the, the ancestral eukaryotes looks you know, more like this, um, uh, trypanosome, with, you know, because they ha all have, all eukaryotes have nuclei, mitochondria, ER, Golgi, peroxisomes, lysosomes, cilia. So in fact, uh, this is something again, Karim mentioned that the individual cell um, at its origin, the eukaryotic cell, and probably maybe even the first uh, cell that gave rise to everything else on earth, were probably incredibly complicated, not simple. Um, and you can even imagine that uh, with evolution, we actually get a simplification of very complex systems, uh, which is something that Pauline Hogweg has ar argued that evolution might simplify rather than complexify. But really this makes the case that the eukaryotic cell is a community, it's not one cell, it's a communion of cells living together. Um, and so this is a sort of simplified way to see that. So we have an archaeal cell, probably from this Asgard TAC branch that came together with an alpha protein bacteria to give rise to the eukaryotic cell. And while we don't know how that happened, um, in 2014, with David Baum, um, we proposed a very simple model, which uh, is pie in the sky, <laughs> you might say, but it, it's a, a framework by which to understand how it might have happened. And I think what I liked about the model is that it's simple. So we can imagine that there are two cells, an archaeal cell and a bacterial cell, which are sharing resources. Because they're sharing resources, they become more and more intimate. And through growing intimacy, um, we imagine that you get these growths that surround these proto-mitochondria, um, and when you confuse these uh, cytoplasmic domains, you end up with what looks like a eukaryotic cell. And the key thing in this, in this sort of diagram is that we imagine that the nucleus, in a way, is the sort of vestige of the original archaeal cell, and the cytoplasm with all the metabolism, you know, um, oxygen free radicals and stuff is on the outside, and you're separating the DNA from the, the work of the cell. And what was really exciting for us is that recently, in the last year, um, Imachi Nobu identified one of these Asgard archaeas. They grew it up in culture. It took them 12 years. 
but they've got a cell that's an obligate syntrope. It always has to live with another cell to share resources. And it shares them through these protrusions, which are a bit like the way we imagined um, in our model. So we, this doesn't prove it, of course, but it, it, it means that I think we can look at our closest ancestors in our care, the Asgard, and we can see these are cells that share resources with other cells to live a bit like our cells do. At least that's clear. And what this also um, made us do is to rethink the eukaryotic cell a bit, because if you take this perspective that the nucleus is kind of a vestige of the archaeal cell and the cytoplasm is the new thing that's grown around it, and of course mitochondria are these other cells that are living together with us. Um, you can also um, reimagine that the cell cycle, which we talk about in how you make two cells, for example, of course is not a cell cycle, it's a nuclear division cycle. Um, and in Fleming's you know, first studies of mitosis, he wasn't studying cell division, he was studying nuclear division. And even in Remac, who's one of the first people to describe cell division, he has these diagrams, I always used to use these in lectures to show he discovered cell division, but he also has pictures of nuclear division. And many organisms, as we heard beautifully from Amy, actually live as in situ where nuclei divide. And so it could be that in some sense, the ancestral uh, eukaryote might have been actually a syncytium with lots of nuclei, might have been fused cells fusing, making a bit of a mess. We don't know. Um, so, but again, it might be in a complicated cell, maybe even a syncytial cell that gave rise to eukaryotes. And so just to give you a flavor of what that enabled us to do. So just thinking in this way, which is of course abstract and might be completely wrong. It got two people in my lab, Chantal and Gotham, thinking about nuclear division. So if we think about the eukaryotic cell and the nucleus as the heart of it, how do nuclei divide? And they took two examples from eukaryotes where you have a classic closed mitosis like in yeast where the nuclear envelope remains shut and an open mitosis like in flies where the nuclear envelope breaks up each division. And we asked, you know, we're trying to sort of get to the picture of what was the original sort of uh, cell cycle like having nuclear divide. And what Gotham showed is that actually these beautiful dividing pombi nuclei, which are completely closed in the sense they maintain nuclear things all the way through mitosis. In fact, he showed it's open <laughs> because the final scission point at the middle of the spindle is actually you disassemble nuclear pores and it looks like it's open. So closed equals open. And Chantal working in flies, which are traditionally open, actually she showed that you have a beautiful nuclear envelope with lamina all the way through division and even things that are in nuclear envelope are there. So open equals closed, suggesting that again, eukaryotes all come, although people just put them in different camps, they actually all use quite similar processes to really divide the nucleus. And again, the nucleus is really at the heart of the cell. And this has been proposed before and sort of following up what Amy said, um, many, many organisms are better seen as collections of nuclei, which are autonomous rather than cells, which are autonomous. So the city or blastoderm of flies, also muscle cells, they come together often through cell fusion, but people have shown with mouse and human nuclei uh, coming together to form muscles that are hybrid, that each nucleus controls the local cytoplasm. And of course, Amy gave a beautiful talk about these amazing sensitia. So I, I sort of feel that we should sometimes think of multicellular um, things, not as multicellular, but multinuclear systems. And the cell is the wrong level of, um, uh, the wrong way to define the system. It's a multinuclear system. So how are we in the lab going to sort of uh, study, you know, look back in time? As Andrew said, we need a TARDIS. We don't have um, either. Um, um, and uh, so Andrew talked about re-engineering. But the other thing we're trying to do in the lab is to take examples from our care, our close relatives, and try to understand with collaborators how um, different systems can go through a progression a bit like we imagine the progression from archaeal cell with a bacterial cell to a modern eukaryotic cell. And so for example, there are archaea which fight each other and kill each other and act autonomously. There are ones, and this is from Alex Bisson, who I think is in the audience, can grow together to form consortia where they're a bit like multicellular. There are archaea that form um, contacts with other archaea and share resources, sometimes parasitic, maybe also sharing. And of course, the Asgard archaea have two different cell types that seem to grow together, require each other, and in a cooperation. And of course, in the end, we hope to find other organisms that are closer to eukaryotes on Earth today that might be sharing resources. And so we're doing this as uh, one of the projects in the lab. This is one thing we're doing as part of the Simons Moore Foundation. And I think it's a great initiative they're doing to, to sort of bring people together to, to, to address these problems. And I know many people here are part of that initiative. And what we've thought about is that um, 
all these teams here and all the people listed here, what we're doing is we're focusing on this contact between two cells. So you have two cells which are making contact and that contact is critical because it requires self-recognition. Are you self or non-self? And it requires, you, know, you can have material exchange, you can have killing. Um, and so we've got different systems which each of the teams is working on where we think in some examples that will lead to fusion of our care. In other systems, it will lead to um, competition or sharing. And we also think that this is probably the basis of eukaryogenesis, this contact between the mitochondria, proto-mitochondria and an archaeal cell. So finally, so what, what should Janelia do, <laughs> I think? Um, so one, one thing I wanted to say is that we spent a lot of history of biology, and Andrew sort of talked about this really, is showing how that by bringing organisms into the lab and taming them, this is a picture of the fly lab um, and bridges in the fly lab um, in, two, in sort of uh, 1910, um, you can tame organisms and study how life works. But there are problems with bringing organisms into the lab. They may not behave because they're out of their normal environment properly. And the other approach, like Jane Goodall uh, did, is she went into the environment and she tried to study organisms in their context. And I think a key challenge for the future is, as we're destroying the planet, um, trying to understand the ecosystems across the planet. And so what I would think would be a wonderful thing is if we could actually study cellular ecosystems in labs, which means multicellular organisms, I would argue, are just cell communities. Um, um, so you could do it with multicellular systems, but also single cell communities like biofilms. And I think that there's lots of um, people you know, started down this path. So one thing we've recently, of course, discovered Asgard through environmental sampling of genomes. So that's incredibly powerful. We're sampling the planet, see what's there. Um, Imachi and Nobu um, spent 12 years trying to culture one of these organisms from sediments because they grow slowly. So we need more of these um, unculturable systems cultured. And Stan Liebel is one of the people who's pioneered building ecosystems that are dynamic, where you can really study how cells interact with each other in complex ecosystems, and, and you get incredibly rich, interesting behavior. But to do this, we need tools, which I think um, would be very exciting to do. So do we take the lab to the environment or do we take the environment to the lab? We have to think about that, but I think we need to sample systems, but I'm a model system person. So I believe we do need to build in labs um, these sort of model communities, which we could then study. And we need lots of new tools. Um, we need genetics for each of these systems. For example, my lab work with sulfalobus, they grow at 75 degrees centigrade. We need a high temperature GFP. We need help with that. <laughs> so all these systems will have problems, genetics, et cetera. But I think it'd be wonderful if we could um, start to study these ecosystem problems in the lab. Thank you. Thank you very much, Buzz. Um, we think we can open things up for questions. Um, I, maybe maybe I'll start start things off. You know, in, in terms of thinking about studying uh, evolution in the lab and sort of the, the detailed mechanics of what sort of happened at these sort of transition states, if you will, where you know archaea merges with some other life form. Um, you know these these are incredibly rare events. So what what you know, just trying to think about what we learn about trying to push on those events in the lab and if you could comment on that. Well, I think we assume they're rare because we know that one eukaryote gave rise to all eukaryotes on Earth and one cell gave rise to all, you know, a whole of life on Earth is a colony from one event. That doesn't mean there was only one event. It just means that one out competed sure. everything else. Sure. And I think I, I, I definitely thought when we came up with our model that we'd never be testable, really. But what I think is amazing is that there's a lot about the world, although we're destroying it, that we don't know about at all. And the Asgard are a great example of things that they don't grow fast, they grow slowly. And life, again, doesn't have to win by growing fast. You can have persisters that just persist a long time. And these cells um, live in sediments. There isn't much, much resource and they, they probably grow very slowly. So I think my hope is we can identify things that really give us clues about, I mean, if we found an alpha proteobacteria with an Asgard archaea, which are you know, involved in the consortium, which is maybe not obligate, they can exchange, you know, it'd be hard to argue that that's not relevant because we know that our closest relative on the archaeal side is, is, is our scar and the closest relative on um, back to our... So I think we're not trying to recreate it, but I think we can really get... I mean, I, I don't really care actually how it happened exactly, but I think that we can really learn a lot about our cells um, and maybe um, how our cells work and how, for example, multicellularity might have um, 
come to be by studying these systems. Great, thanks. Um, so I see a number of hands raised. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Wen Ying. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Buzz. Um, thanks for such a thought-provoking talk. So my question for you is that, um, is it, if your mind is correct, then you would position of the nuclear membrane should be very similar to the position of plasma membrane. You see? Wen Ying, we're having a little bit of a trouble hearing you. Yeah, I couldn't quite hear. I love okay, you. Okay, I will then. So okay, what you're saying about the, yeah, so the prediction, maybe you were saying about the nuclear membrane. So one thing I think, what, one thing that we were thinking about is that, of course, eukaryotes tend to differ on the outside, which is our model is the new bit. The nuclear envelope and the nuclear pores, for example, is incredibly well conserved across eukaryotes, which is why, in a way, we started doing nuclear division, because it made us think that if the nucleus is old, it really should be doing similar things in different systems, which it does seem to be. I'll maybe go to Will next. Great talk, Buzz. Um, it strikes me that the origin of eukaryotes, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is kind of going out, is, is roughly analogous to the origin of multicellularity in the sense, in, in one important way, which is that we keep pushing back the boundaries of like what's an innovation and what's uh, a co-option. Like a lot of eukaryote specific genes turns out they're an Asgard, right? And so we've, we keep shrinking the window of sort of what you have to invent to become eukaryotic. So if you want to run with that analogy a little bit, like what, what is the co-option that's critical for eukaryotes? Is symbiosis really that important? Or is symbiosis like a neat little thing that turned out to be important, but really, I mean, we see lots of obligate symbioses in nature. We only see one eukaryote though, right? So, so it's, anyway, yeah. No, I think that's a really fascinating question. I mean, it relates maybe to what Zeb was asking about how special was that event? I mean, one thing that is extraordinary, which is what, what we're really animating us is that the, the cell body really looks like, and the genes like cytoskeleton genes really come from Asgard, it's, that's pretty clear. But the lipids and stuff all come from bacteria. And of course we work with cell division and escort division, dependent division, for example, is an alkyl protein working with bacterial lipids. <laughs> um, and so I think understanding whether that coming together gives you, for example, phase transitions in the lipids or, you know, is that a biophysical? So, so I think sometimes that's what's maybe interesting. Sometimes coming together gives you something completely new is in innovation. So maybe in a way like the first cell, maybe I was arguing that, that sometimes the reason I sort of said Darwin's got it wrong is that sometimes I think the key innovations come from a horizontal gene transfer or something where it's just a machine that you don't have already, which really enables you to do something you can't do, like for example, see light or um, yeah remodel membrane in a certain way. So understanding that would be great, but we need to do that. We need to understand our care, which we don't at all, understand bacteria. And then, and then I think, yeah, um, we'd love to know what happens when you bring those together. All right, thanks, thanks again, Buzz. And uh, I see you have a, a, a burning question from, from Manu in the chat and a couple other people. Uh, so uh, uh, next up we have uh, Louis Prawl. Um, coming from uh, Alex Hughes Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. All right, uh, you see my slides? Yeah, it looks great. Awesome. All right, uh, well, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present. Um, and thank you to uh, the Hughes Lab and colleagues at Penn Medicine and our funding sources. So um, we are, there we go. Uh, I'm interested in, um, uh, how do multicellular tissues, organs, and organisms optimize their function under constraints? Um, in the case today, we'll be talking about kidney development um, under a geometric constraint. So in this video, we see um, branching morphogenesis occurring within a kidney, which is driven by reciprocal signaling interactions between an epithelium and a mesenchyme. And what this branching morphogenesis is doing is it's creating new branching tips, which are the, uh, the location where nephrons form. Uh, there's a huge uh, variability of uh, nephrons between human kidneys. Um, and as the functional filtration unit of the kidney, you might imagine this is important for kidney function. Low nephron count is a risk factor for adult kidney disease. So we wanted to understand how does, what, are, what are some limitations that might be placed in this process and how does the organ navigate through these. So we use mouse kidneys as our model system. Um, in mice, 
kidney development occurs between about embryonic day E11 and postnatal day P2. So here are um, some example images of uh, fixed and stained whole mount kidneys. You can see an epithelial marker in green and a mesenchyme marker in uh, magenta. Um, you note that um, in the two example images, which are separated just two days of age, there's an increased packing density of these individual tips at the surface. This is uh, noted by um, other groups as well in human and mouse kidney. So I wanna note a few things from this. First, there's no stereotype branching pattern of this epithelium. So no two, epi no two kidneys are alike. Second is that each of these um, epithelial tips has a, has a sort of repulsion to um, other tips. This is well-documented, but poorly understood. And third is that there, even as the number of tips is growing exponentially in these uh, later stages, there is only a modest decrease in the distance between tips. So how do epithelial tips in the developing kidney avoid a surface packing conflict? We uh, sought to use tissue clearing methods to look at the underlying branching structures. So shown here is um, a, a cutaway view of a cleared mouse kidney and uh, uh, inset of a tubule family. PNA lectin is a surface epithelial marker shown in gray. And then um, 62 is uh, these magenta clouds of mesenchyme cells that surround each tip. I wanna note something about terminology here. Um, we refer to older generations as nodes. So there's a daughter, parent, grandparent, great-grandparent terminology that refers to the age of these branching points. So we can use this uh, geometric information to make models of individual tip family. Um, this is uh, this is modeled as um, like uh, rigid rods encased in a uh, elastic box, and there are three key units um, that I wanted to go over um, here. Each modeled in terms of units of length. First is this preferred node diameter, which governs the tip repulsion. Um, Second is the lateral domain size, which models the uh, confinement due to tip duplication. And third is the vertical domain height, which models the distance between the daughter and the great grandparent nodes. So distance from the kidney surface. All of these interactions are, are elastic and we are considering that um, the effects of curvature are negligible on an individual family. So to simulate a patch of the kidney surface, we can embed a number of these tubule families within a larger box. You can see that once we let them settle into a uh, random configuration, this resembles the tubule structures that we see at the surface of a kidney at E14.5. But what happens at these later stages where more tips are being produced? So I'm gonna walk through this uh, phase plot here um, on the left, um, starting from the basically the point that I was showing before, which is this purple um, uh, regime that we refer to as parent nodes at the surface and random orientation of uh, tubules. As, this, um, as the lateral domain shrinks, they or start to orient into these H shapes shown here in blue. So this captures about up to E15.5. Um, I also note regime of inefficient packing shown in gray. But what happens at these further stages? So, um, we do identify two types of errors that can occur. First, uh, starting from this H's phase, as the lateral domain continues to shrink, some tips wind up being unable to avoid each other anymore, and they collide and fuse and form these short circuits. This is shown in orange. And then in this, this red phase, um, this is this is where the where the uh, domain space might be sufficient to have some tubules escape the surface um, in the in the vertical dimension. So some tubules do still reach the surface, but then others become buried. This is um, this is also uh, what we consider an erroneous state. So how do how might the kidney avoid these two um, erroneous states? Uh, we we show that there is actually a uh, a trajectory through this phase space that can lead tips from this H's configuration into a, a vertically oriented state. So this buries the parent and the grandparent older nodes 
further within uh, uh, deeper tissue layers and allows the tips to vertically orient at, at the surface. So you can see increasing tip surface density with, um, within this uh, cutaway plot. So is there literature evidence for this type of vertical packing? Yes, we, we, we reviewed some, uh, some literature and then have some of our own data as well, showing that at about E15.5, tubules start to switch to a more vertically oriented um, state and these, um, these older nodes start to become buried in deeper tissue layers. So we can find regimes in the model that uh, predict these shapes. And um, this leads us to two um, mechanistic predictions that we can make. First is that tubules are under radial tension during this switch to vertical pack. Mm. And second is that uh, removing the radial tension on tubules could cause these buried tip packing errors I referred to earlier. So to test this first uh, prediction experimentally, um, we wanted to sever the connection between the epithelium and the surrounding tissue. I wanna note that there is some literature basis for um, the fact that there might be a, uh, a tension on tubules, namely uh, this uh, node retraction phase that was described by Lindstrom et al. in 2015. This is uh, what was observed in cultured kidney explants where older nodes were pulled inwards towards the tip of the, or towards the top of the ureter and started at about E15.5. We suspect this would uh, produce an, a radial force on tubules. So we use dispace to cleave the basement membrane proteins that attach the two tissues. And then here's an example um, or schematic of our experiment and the expected deformation at small uh, delta T. Here's an example tip family of a lectin labeled kidney. Um, and so we treated these with this base and collected uh, Z stacks at various uh, defined time intervals after uh, adding the, after adding this base. You can see there's a, a shape change of the tubule family at the surface. And there's also this void that's formed between the, uh, the surface, the, between the two tissues. So we quantify this over multiple kidneys we see that there is about a 25 to 30% reduction in the apparent surface area of these, these tubule families um, in the dispace treated condition and very little change in the controls. We can partially abolish this by inhibiting actin myosin contractility with levostatin or Y drug. So uh, this, these are consistent with a vertical or inward pulling force on tubules. The second prediction that we had is that removing this radial tension on tubules could lead to buried tip packing errors. We sought to test this in cap explants where uh, we cut a portion of the kidney surface and separate it from the, uh, the internal structure. And we suspect that this will, will remove this internal pulling force and that this tissue will contract. So here's our schematic of the experiment. And here's a, a lectin labeled explant that has contracted over 24 hours. When we uh, fixed and stain these for epithelial and mesenchymal markers, we can see some tips that appear to be buried deeper within tissue layers. So on the, on the right here are height maps of this uh, PNA lectin channel. And these um, show that these tips are indeed with, deeper within the kidney. We can annotate the X, Y, and Z coordinates of these buried tips and create tip height maps of these uh, surfaces and show that the buried tips appear as dimples within the height map. Uh, by contrast, intact kidney controls cultured for the same amount of time have a smooth surface and don't seem to have any buried tips. So in conclusion, we argue that the, uh, the kidney epithelium encounters a surface packing problem during development. And we've developed a geometric model that can predict packing morphology uh, during uh, various developmental stages, as well as uh, various types of packing errors. Uh, we ex show experimentally that epithelial tubules are subject to a radial tension uh, during these node retraction phase. And um, there's also li literature evidence for these branching morphology changes and uh, packing errors in mice, which I did not have the time to uh, go into. So uh, there are a few um, themes that I was thinking about relating this back to the motivating question. Um, 
Uh, first is the idea of evolutionary trade-offs. So how does a tissue or organ or organism achieve maximum functional capacity while subjected to constraints? So our example was how many nephrons or how many tips can a, can a kidney build? Second, how does understanding these limitations influence our ability to engineer better tissues for regenerative medicine? And then also in the, in the spirit of kind of a dream experiment, what would we need to drive this project further? It would be amazing to image these epithelial rearrangements inside a live kidney or an explant. So this would require tissue specific live imaging probes, uh, imaging modalities compatible with live samples and tools to assay information exchange between cells and tissues to uh, tease out mechanism. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to take any questions or comments. Great, thanks so much, Lewis. Uh, really, really incredible work. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, I see again, lots of comments in the, in the chat, um, but maybe I'll start off again. So it, 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 at the beginning of the presentation, or the, I guess I should say in the middle of the presentation, you outlined um, a series of parameters that when altered sort of move you through this branching phase space. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could you know, speculate as to what are the underlying cell behaviors, sort of molecules, not, not to get us back to the conversation earlier, but um, <laughs> that might be controlling uh, some of these parameters. Yeah, so the uh, tip repulsion, there's some evidence to suggest that there are uh, secreted like TGF beta family proteins that mediate this repulsion between epithelial tips. Um, uh, the the, the, there are also interactions between, there's a mesenchyme and there are stromal tissues that could potentially be playing a role here in sort of organizing into layers and uh, maybe, maybe even corralling uh, these tip positions. And then branching in the kidney is driven by this really tightly regulated uh, RET GDNF signaling between the epithelium and mesenchyme. Um, so I think those are, those are, probably the key things that are very finely tuned um, to, to create this, this parameter space. Do you, do you find that as at this transition where the nodes begin to become buried sort of deeper in the, in the kidney volume, uh, is anything interesting happening there in terms of the balances between cell proliferation and surface to volume ratio or? Yeah. It's an uh, like this, this one transition during the morphogenesis, like like in the in the cap explant experiment, we haven't really looked at those parameters. But I, I, yeah, that would be really interesting to go in and 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 look at like proliferation markers in some of those areas to see if those are changing. Yeah, that was that was beautiful, Lewis. Um, does can can some of this packing help to explain that order of magnitude difference in the number of of nephrons that are observed across individuals, or is there another explanation for for that variability? Yeah, um, I I don't know that there is a that there is a lot of data out there that shows like correlations say between kidney size and number of nephrons very very cleanly. I I think it could relate to, yeah, that order of magnitude difference between, between individuals. It, it could potentially be regulated through this packing process. And some of these like, uh, like birth defects could affect that variability. Why don't, why don't we begin um, bringing some of the, the speakers back back on for the panel discussion. So, so one theme that, that clearly cut across a lot of the, the, the presentations uh, this afternoon was this notion of you know, what's, what's being diversified in terms of putting together the parts to build an organism. Um, and so, there, there are clearly a, a series of presentations that focused very much on the nuclei. Um, and a series of presentations focused a little bit more on the cell. And I, we started to get into the, this conversation about what might be some advantages and disadvantages between these two strategies of dividing labor, as, um, as Andrew put it. And so I, I wonder if 
you know, people would maybe begin to share some thoughts as to why organisms might choose one path or another. And don't all talk at once. I mean, maybe one thing I, oh, guess what you start. Yeah, my, my intuition is that uh, having a synthetical morphology or, or organization will uh, inevitably limit the possibilities because it will be very hard to really differentiate and, and evolve high, high level of division of labor. And I don't know what would be the most complex organism, but it's probably the, the, uh, the, the fungi, which are, so the, all, all the ones which we eat like mushrooms, this is all a, a synthesium. This is what I would really like to, to know, Amy, if you can come. No, the, the fruiting body is made of multiple cells very few cell shapes build it right so there's just a few different shapes of cells they get stitched together but underneath that is is in general many cases a syncytium but and then so, the syncytium itself is just one blob it's it's it, it cannot differentiate into a body or, or something more complex well the the, the fruiting bodies emerge from the syncytium yeah I know my point was that you need the cellular organization to, to have morphological complexity of some sort that you see in the, in the fruiting body. If you, yeah, I, I think uh, that is a true statement. Um, in terms of being able to more complexly divide labor, I would argue you may not need that morphological complexity though, right? Um, that potentially a branching network is already a fair amount of morphological complexity to divide labor spatially and temporally. Um, and that in some ways you have many more combinations in which you can mix different skills and different abilities, right? Um, rather than necessarily being terminally bound to a particular division, right? Um, so that's a different kind of space, right? Than I think maybe the space that you're imagining in terms of morphogenic space, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess what would be interesting to know is by let's say nuke taking a big syncytium from a forest and see how many states there are. And, Absolutely, man. I that is like nuke seek on a lot of these is something that we're really focusing on right now. Um, because I, I think that to capture the different states is critical. We'd love to do it in the forest. We're not doing that right now, but when that forest ecosystem gets reconstructed inside Janelia, according to Buzz's dream, then um, we'll be there. <laughs> All right, uh, maybe Sarah, then Jennifer, and then Will. I just wanted to quickly add on with the idea of, of organizing its complexity. There's lots of different like ways to get at that. So we saw with, with Physarium and we've seen with um, with Mycelium, there's ways for, for flow and for transport. But I mean, also in my system, there's specifically microtubule trafficking for the different organelles um, and, and nuclei to get around. And that might be how they're differentiating, even though we don't know necessarily what they're doing there yet. Um, regarding the syncytia formation, um, I think it's going to be really interesting to try to understand what's so different about fungi and how they're using syncytia in such an um, important way to develop themselves. I mean, in the fruiting body, Amy, the, the cells that are dispersed, the sex cells, they're not part of that syncytia, right? They're separate. The syncytium is just a, a device for delivery. Um, yeah, correct. So, you know, spores will be single cells. They sometimes are multinucleated, right? So certain fungi will have syncytial yeah. spores. Right, right. Um, but we yeah, found, there's been cellularization has occurred at that point. Yeah. And we've recently been um, playing around with cell-cell fusion in vertebrate cells. And what we find is that if we drive cell-cell fusion, the cells very quickly 
transition to a differentiated state. I mean, within a few minutes, um, you'll see YAP move out of the nucleus and you have a whole differentiated program that's switched on, um, suggesting that if that's normally occurring in vertebrate cells, that's basically an end state. You're not going to have the flexibility of, um, you know, going back into a proliferative state, which, you know, the vertebrate system may want to preserve in particular um, tissues or organ systems. But except yeah, muscle, perhaps muscle, if, if you, muscle, sorry, really. Muscles, you, yeah, except, well, muscles use their satellite cells to pull. But there you, can also, you can also get multicellular muscles and they will go back like um, in, in, in vertebrates. They Sorry, will go back to start dividing or what? It's satellite cells that give No, but you can't, you can't, but you can get cells going backwards. And, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. I mean, I would argue though that, that your definition there is just proliferation as a, as a function, right. right? I think we know very little about nuclei once they enter into a vertebrate syncytium, actually how, different, how differently differentiated they are whether they persist in that state. Um, for yeah, sure they don't point. enter the nuclear division cycle again, but we right. don't know the degree to which they change their transcriptional programs. Exactly. Um, that's not right. been, been characterized, right? right. Um, and, and so I, I think we have to be careful in how we define that. If it's just mm -hmm. proliferation as, you know, as the end state right. is, is simply being assessed as, as whether it's proliferating or not, I think. Is, exactly, is, is no, I, I totally, Agree. Yeah. Well, certainly in the case of placenta, it's clear there are so many more attributes that are acquired once it the trophoblasts fuse into the syncytium. Um, yeah, exactly. That, trophy, that the placenta is doing so much more than any of the, you know, A any of the individual starting any cells, individual exactly. cells that mm -hmm. are coming into it. So it, it sort of gives a bigger um, perspective. Well, I was just going to point out that to me, syncytia are on a continuum, but maybe not a hard limit on complexity in the sense that it, 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 it tends to break down spatial gradients, but you can still get spatial gradients. And I think the gradients are probably the, the important thing for developing, you know, d distinct parts. And here's a kind of cool example that I only was recently made available of. I'll put a link in the chat. There's a single celled marine alga, which is, it looks like a plant. It's half a meter long. It's called Calerpa. It has, you know, essentially complex leaves with complex pinnate morphology. It has rhizoids. It has roots. You can cut it up. It'll regrow. It's like, it's an incredible single-celled organism with hundreds of millions of nuclei, I think, like packed with nuclei. Um, and spatially organized transcription, right? So exactly. there's exactly. tremendous polarization, right? Yes. Within that state, right? That's, that's exactly right. Um, so a lot of the mechanisms that we're interested in multicellularity are able to play out within a single cell that's, that's certainly has some mixing, but also has gradients and is able to, to figure out how to sort of localize things to different spots. So within an organism that contains a large number of cells that are connected by various amounts of movement of stuff, it seems like you could still get a fair amount of complexity. And so I think it's all kind of a continuum in, in some sense. Buzz? Yeah, so I mean, I think I really agree with that. And I think in a way, that's what I guess I was and Amy trying to make clear is that I think, you know, you know, what one one thing is really clear is that the, the nucleus is really the thing that's defining state in the, you know, in the syncytium, you can have nuclear with different states and they can do different things locally, but it's the nuclear has a state. And I think in multicellular organisms, we typically do think that, that the nucleus is the center of control, that there isn't so much in the cytoplasmic state. And, uh, and of course, in single cells, very complex single cell systems, the cells, you know, the cell actually, for example, the, the cytoskeleton can also define um, state in a more complicated way. But animals, do, especially animals and plants, I think they are nuclei have distinct states which drive locally different things. Um, so I think that is runs across, which is why I think the nucleus is so important. Um, but of course, I think one thing that animals, for example, which have in a tissue made of lots of different cells in an animal, of course, you can also, as Eduardo Moreno just talked about beautifully, you can also get rid of cells or move them around. Or So I think there, there's definitely additional things you can get from being multicellular, but it's more subtle 
and exactly as Will, you were saying, that the difference between a syncytium and a multicellularism is quite subtle, but there are differences. Yeah. Ache, I saw your hand up. I don't know if. Yes, I wanted to ask uh, something, but Buzz actually replied my question while I was. <laughs> Okay. Uh, just uh, when I had my hand up, yeah. Um, so, you know, another question along these lines, Buzz, you made me think of is this, you know, if, if division of labor and function is determined at the level of the nucleus, but the gene products of that nucleus are being translated in the cytoplasm, which sort of we think of as playing a pretty critical role in the, the epigenetics of, of cells, does, does that provide certain limits in terms of regional specialization of these syncytia? Like, how do you think about different RNAs moving out of the nucleus and being translated and post-translationally modified and everything else? I, I can speak to your person, yeah, Amy. I can speak to that. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, and 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 certainly we think this is one functional role of of RNA protein assemblies, condensates that form transiently and restrict diffusion um, of those assemblies and potentially spatially biased translation, um, so that you can get sort of functional cell-like territories of cytoplasm. Um, of course, diffusion will be a limit, um, you know, over some length scale, no matter what, um, but th through condensation that you can really spatially pattern nuclear territories, um, the, the adjacent cytoplasm um, can be, be somewhat specified as a distinct territory, despite being in a shared state. Um, I think using non-membrane bound organelles for this uh, achieves or enables a potential amount of flexibility so that you can change the size of the cohort whether you have an individual nucleus that's in charge of that identity versus a, pop, a, a, a series of neighbors that might be sharing resources, right? And so by using something that's quite reversible to establish what these territories are, um, I think this gives you actually a lot of flexibility over um, kind of the scale of a region and that that doesn't have to be permanent, that that can be responsive to um, spatially varying signals, um, and, and basically that the scale of that can grow and shrink depending. And, and so, I mean, that's one mechanism by which um, I think despite being shared, you can create, you know, areas where goods are, are restricted. Um, I don't know what other people want to think, say about that or think about that. Jennifer, I saw your hand up. Yeah, Amy, I totally agree with what you're saying, but I want to, um, I want to return to Buzz and some of the things that he was making, the, some of the points that he was making with respect to the nucleus and sort of putting the nucleus sort of at this pedestal and sort of diminishing the significance of the cytoplasm. Um, <laughs> I want to support that cytoplasm. First off, the mitochondria are in that cytoplasm and the mitochondria are very critical for every kind of, you know, all the metabolic pathways that, you know, the cell is engaged in. It's also very significant for the lipid flux within cells and fatty acid, the fatty acid consumption, cholesterol biosynthesis, which is driving all of the membrane trafficking pathways. So it's, I think you have to not ignore all of the fundamental things going on in the cytoplasm. And Red blood cells don't have nuclei and they are, you know, they live for how many days, you know, a month or more, uh, doing some critical things in our body. So um, I don't want to be too nuclear centric. Um, you know, I think we could actually have a big debate about cytoplasm versus nucleus. Um, but, you know, basically RNA comes out of the nucleus, um, but everything else is all cytoplasmic um, driven, if you ask me. You just need an RNA generating machine and that takes over your nucleus role. I'll just throw that out as something controversial. Um, Done with DNA, man. <laughs> As you want to respond to that really quickly before we go on? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, maybe like, 
uh, Andrew, Andrew Murray was saying, I, I mean, in the end, I'm a bit like a, a crick. It, when it comes down to it, I think, of course, mechanics plays a key role, self has a key role. But in terms of like complexity, how you generate a distinct set of states, I think you need, you know, lots of complexity, which is transcription factors on DNA, reading it out, and they're different programs written. No, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 no, so that's fascinating. You need to be simple about that, you know, it really is life. You know, I do think, of course, DNA doesn't define life. It's just, you know, because it just makes proteins, which do have, you know, in the outside. But I think that is the guiding um, sort of I, thing. I, I agree. It certainly space. has been our, our mantra. Uh, Ache, your hand's back. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I wanted to go back to Amy's point about saying that you can act, that you can define kind of, um, a distinct cytoplasm actually in, in, in hyphae, for instance, and or in cells that have no, uh, are not cellularized, it's all nuclei. And I completely agree that you can do that, but uh, I'm trying to compare it to animals, to multicellular uh, organisms that are animals, and we barely see that. We always have uh, cells with, except, with very few exceptions. And one exception is the Drosophila early embryo, actually, where you have a syncytium, and then the cells cellularize before they start to move, before the embryo starts having movement. So the question, well, just start the transition actually. So the question for you is, do you think actually that that you need actually to define the cells, like to put a membrane around the nucleus when the cells need to start moving? I think the movement has anything to do with that. And this is what we see some organisms that don't move, like that they have cell walls and the cells don't move actually that can have syncytium. Or you think it's not, it has nothing to do with that? That's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't thought about that as a, as a motivating reason to cellularize. Um, I guess I'm thinking about chytrids, a basal fungus that does move, but it loses its cell wall while it's moving. Um, <laughs> so it's, and it's also after cellularization that it's moving. So that fits your rule. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and I guess it comes down to what is what is in motion. Um, if you think about the networks that that we see that fungi form, these mycelial networks, that does get you from point A to point B. Um, you just stay in point A, and then you grow into point B, right? Um, so it's a different kind of motion, but maybe you you actually uh, accomplish some of the same things that you need to when you're moving. So. I'm not sure if I would use that rule necessarily for that reason. Um, I think it's really interesting how many syncytia do exist in animals, right? Um, it's not that these don't exist, right? And so I think that really raises a, a like what is the functional difference between them, right? I um, I think I think that's still a mystery, honestly, right? Um, so can can we could also define it a little bit more in the continuum again instead of like saying this syncytium or this like because you could actually define the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio volume volume ratios and say like there are cells that have a ton of cytoplasm actually a many nuclei or you can actually have uh, the opposite half as very small actually there are cells that have essentially nearly all nuclei and the cytoplasm is really small in 3D tissues in animals it's really compacted actually and it's nearly all nuclei so the question is and maybe that goes also for uh, Jennifer as well. Like, what what do you think actually of like these differences in having cells that nearly have no cytoplasm and cells that have to that share it among different nuclei? What what would be the function of this? Do the cells with no cytoplasm actually do anything, or they they just no 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 space? I haven't said no cytoplasm. It's a very small. But no, but I mean, do those cells <laughs> with minimal cytoplasm do they actually do anything, or are they just like bricks in a wall? No no. Like, no I wonder if it do. correlates with, with how like active and intelligent a cell is. Uh, you mean point, how much actually. water, how much free water there is in the cell, or what? But how, how much cytoplasm is doing anything? So, so, how much cytoplasmic volume you have compared to nuclear volume? You take a cell and you. So that I think is really that's a super exciting thing because that's what would differentiate the syncytia from individual cells. The individual cells, because they can. Personally, I think that this this nuclear volume, this nuclear cytoplasmic ratio um, is really, really important. Volume, water content, free water content in the cell is probably driving, triggering all kinds of metabolic 
processes, you have the ability to tune that in an individual, uh, with individual cells uh, across thousands of nuclei if they are separate. Um, and so you can have the individual cells within that population being um, experiencing different forces or um, you know, changes in their ionic environment that, would, that could allow for differentiation across that, that nu the, the nuclei or the, the cellular system that you would not have as easily generated across a syncytium because a syncytium by definition is a shared cytoplasm. So everybody is to a certain extent experiencing something similar about that uh, cytoplasm and less, unless the nuclei, nuclei get clustered in some way where you might get a diffusion um, limitation in diffusion of you know, particular you know, signaling factors or um, transcription factors, et cetera. Um, interestingly, we find in the case of the placenta as well as other um, syncytia that we generate spontaneously with vertebrate cells is that the nuclei cluster. Um, uh, that seems to be a key feature of those systems. It doesn't seem to be a feature of um, these fungi, however. And, um, but um, anyway, I think that could be a key point uh, in terms of what is um, the different strategies uh, that these cells are taking um, in forming multicellular systems. So, so could I change the subject? Yeah. I think we've gotten too much on the syncytial side, but. Can I select? Because I was asked Celeste. I mean, Gashba also. There's lots of things I want to ask him, but Celeste, I wonder if you could tell us about because you've got this one engineering problem that you have to get. Uh, you have to exchange oxygen, but you have these different. Um, but you have different solutions. So I was wondering if you could tell us about what you think the the path is and and how sort of the trajectory through solution space is um, in terms of uh, building lungs that can work. You mean in terms of evolutionary time or? Well, so how, how in evolution you started off and, and went um, and, and then yeah. how it started and how you explored the different, how you end up with three completely different or, or seemingly different solutions to the same problem from a presumably a common ancestor. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is one of those unanswerable questions, right? Um, but I, I think the the hint probably comes from some of the discussions that we had yesterday and earlier today that you can't really separate the form that's achieved during evolution from the environmental context, right? So we have to remember that the oxygen concentrations on this planet have not always been 20% in the atmosphere. It's changed quite dramatically over time. And so there's, there's some thought that um, the the more complex structure of the bird lung arose to, uh, to enable uh, life uh, forms during a time when there was lower oxygen concentrations, right? So you needed a much more efficient gas exchanger uh, to, to fill certain niches, all right? So if, if you think about, you know, the, the forms that were, are missing now from, you know, the terminal ends of the tree, um, we, there, there was an age of giant insects, <laughs> which, uh, you know, terrify me to think about, but <laughs> giant insects uh, were, were, were prevalent when there were higher uh, levels of oxygen. So you could rely entirely on diffusion through, uh, through tubes within, within the body. So, so I think the trajectory question is one that, you know, we can speculate, but we, we can't really answer in the absence of of thinking about how how um, you know the environment around these evolving organisms changed over time. So very likely there's there's examples of all of the different possible trajectories that are, are present. And really, what we're missing is an understanding of um, the forms uh, and the morphogenesis of these different gas exchangers in non-model organisms. I, I think um, it, it's unfortunate that we're losing them on this planet, but we can hopefully understand something uh, about biodiversity and evolution of, of multicellular structures from the ones that are, are have remained. Okay. Um, you know, 
I noticed the clock is now going up. So <laughs> I don't know if that means that we're supposed to wrap things up or if we can keep talking. Uh, it, you know, it's it's up to you, but it is about that time. So if you feel like this is a good lull, maybe we can um, close it out and transition any other thoughts to the the closed panelist discussion. Yeah, great. Um, I think it's uh, there's so many things to talk about, you know, in, in terms of uh, what we discussed this afternoon, this morning, and yesterday. Um, but yeah, seem, now seems as good a time as any to to move into the closed discussion. Perfect. So um, if the the um, panelists could um, stay on for our closed discussion, that would be fantastic. I'm going to send an email in a in a minute or so uh, with a reminder about the link, and we'll start that on time, which is in about. Um, little less than 15 minutes. But in the meantime, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to um, close us out. Yeah. Um, I just want to, um, on behalf of Manu, Zev, and Wallace and myself, I want to thank all of you all for participating in this um, really exciting workshop. And this has been incredibly entertaining, um, exciting, illuminating, stimulating last two days. Um, I'm really hopeful that we can continue this type of uh, discussion um, and interrogation into this area. Um, I know this was one of the one of the um, goals of uh, Manu and Zev and um, Wallace and myself as we were talking and organizing this. That um, our feeling was this is a very active field um, that really uh, integrates itself touches on so many areas that are related to four-dimensional cellular physiology. Um, so um, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll organize another one of these workshops or make it even at a symposia, um, make it even in person in the next year or so, uh, because this is a super interesting active um, area. I want to also end by saying, um, you know, this this workshop has been very valuable to Janillians like myself. Um, we're in the process of organizing, uh, as you well know, this 4D cellular uh, physiology research area at Janillia. And uh, I want to just draw your attention to, um, uh, you know, the, the website for this, um, but also um, Draw your attention to the fact that we're, we're in the, the act process of hiring group leaders, both junior and senior in this area. So if you are interested or have um, uh, colleagues who are interested, please, um, please let us know. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>